Section twenty one of Cyropedia The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader is Rosie Roberts from California. Cyropedia The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book five. Chapter two but on the morrow they set out for their march to gabrias cyrus rode on horseback at the head of his new persian cavalry two thousand strong with as many more behind them carrying their shields and swords and the rest of the army followed in due order the cavalry were told to make their new attendants understand that they would be punished if they were caught falling behind the rear guard or riding in advance of the column or straggling on either flank towards evening of the second day the army found themselves before the castle of gabrias and they saw that the place was exceedingly strong and that all preparations had been made for the stoutest possible defence they noticed all that great herds of cattle and endless flocks of sheep and goats had been driven up under the shelter of the castle walls then gabrias sent word to cyrus bidding him ride round and see where the place was easiest of approach and meanwhile sent his trustiest persians to enter the fortress and bring him word what they found within cyrus who really wished to see if the citadel admitted of attack in case gabrias proved false rode all round the walls and found they were too strong at every point presently the messengers who had gone in brought back word that there were supplies enough to last a whole generation and still not fail the garrison while cyrus was wondering what this could mean gabrias himself came out and all his men behind him carrying wine and corn and barley and driving oxen and goat and swine enough to feast the entire host and his stewards fell to distributing the stores at once and serving up a banquet then gabrias invited cyrus to enter the castle now that all the garrison had left it using every precaution he might think wise and cyrus took him at his word and sent in scouts and strong detachment before he entered the palace himself once within he had the gates thrown open and sent for all his own friends and officers and when they joined him gabrias had beakers of gold brought out and pitchers and goblets and costly ornaments and golden coins without end and all manner of beautiful things and last of all he sent for his own daughter tall and fair a marvel of beauty and stateliness still wearing mourning for her brother and her father said to cyrus all these riches i bestow on you for a gift and i put my daughter in your hands to deal with as you think best i but three days gone for my son and she this day for her brother we beseech you to avenge him and cyrus made answer i gave you my promise before that if you kept faith with me i would avenge you so far as in me lay and to-day i see the debt is due and the promise i made to you i repeat to your daughter god helping me i will perform it as for these costly gifts i accept them and i give them for a dowry to your daughter and to him who may win her hand in marriage one gift only i will take with me when i go but that is a thing so precious that if i changed it for all the wealth of babylon or the whole world itself i could not go on my way with half so blithe a heart and gabrias wondered what this rare thing could be half suspecting it might be his daughter what is it my lord said he and cyrus answered i will tell you a man may hate injustice and impiety and lies but if no one offers him vast wealth or unbridled power or impregnable fortresses or lovely children he dies before he can show what manner of man he is but you have placed everything in my hands to-day this mighty fortress treasures of every kind your own power and a daughter most worthy to be won and thus you have shown all men that i could not sin against my friend and my host nor act unrighteously for the sake of wealth nor break my plighted word of my own free will this is your gift and so long as i am a just man and known to be such receiving the praise of my fellow-men i will never forget it i will strive to repay you with every honour i can give doubt not he added but that you will find a husband worthy of your daughter i have many a good man and true among my friends and one of them will win her hand but i could not say whether he will have less wealth or more than what you offer me 
Only one thing you may be certain. There are those among them who will not admire you one whit, the more because of the splendor of your gifts. They will only envy me and supplicate the gods that one day it will be given to them to show that they too are loyal to their friends, that they too will never yield to their foes while life is in them, unless some gods strike them down, that they too would never sacrifice virtue and fair renown for all the wealth you prefer and all the treasure of Syria and Assyria to boot. Such is the nature, believe me, of some who are seated here. And Gabriel smiled, by heaven, I wish you would point them out to me, and I would beg you to give me one of them to be my son-in-law. And Cyrus said, You will not need to learn their names from me. Follow us, and you will be able to point them out yourself. With these words he rose, clasped the hand of Gabrius, and went out, all his men behind him. And though Gabrius pressed him to stay and sup in the citadel, he would not, but took his supper in the camp and constrained Gabrius to take his meal with them. And there, lying on a couch of leaves, he put this question to him. Tell me, Gabrias, who has the largest store of coverlets, yourself or each of us? And the Assyrian answered, You, I know, have more than I, more coverlets, more couches, and far larger dwelling place, for your home is earth and heaven, and every nook may be a couch, and for your coverlets you need not count the fleeces of your flock, but the brushwood and the herbage of hill and plain. Nevertheless, when the meal began, it must be said that Gabrias, seeing the poverty of what was set before him, thought at first that his own men were far more open-handed than the Persians. But his mood changed as he watched the grace and decorum of the company, and saw that not a single Persian who had been schooled would ever gape or snatch at the viands, or let himself be so absorbed in eating that he could attend to nothing else. These men prided themselves on showing their good sense and their intelligence while they took their food, just as a perfect rider sits his horse with absolute composure and can look and listen and talk to some purpose while he puts him through his paces. To be excited or flustered by meat and drink was in their eyes something altogether swinish and bestial. Nor did Gabrius fail to notice that they only asked questions which were pleasant to answer and only jested in a manner to please. All their mirth was as far from impertinence and malice as it was from vulgarity and unseemliness. And what struck him most was their evident feeling that on a campaign, since the danger was the same for all, no one was entitled to a larger share than any of his comrades. On the contrary, it was thought the perfection of the feast to perfect the condition of those who were to share the fighting. And thus when he rose to return home, the story runs that he said, I begin to understand, Cyrus, how it is that while we have more goblets and more gold, more apparel and more wealth than you, yet we ourselves are not worth as much. We are always trying to increase what we possess, but you seem to set your hearts on perfecting your own souls. But Cyrus only answered, My friend, be here without fail tomorrow, and bring all your cavalry in full armor. Thus they parted for the time, and each saw to his own concerns. But when the day dawned, Gabrias appeared with his cavalry and led the way, and Cyrus, as a born general would, not only supervised the march, but watched for any chance to weaken the enemy and add to his own strength. With this in view, he summoned the Hyrcanian chief and Gabrias himself, for they were the two he thought most likely to give him the information that he needed. My friends, said he, I think I shall not err if I trust to your fidelity and consult you about the campaign. You, even more than I, are bound to see the Assyrian do not overpower us. For myself, if I fail, there may well be some loophole of escape. But for you, if the king conquers, I see nothing but enmity on every side. For although he is my enemy, he bears me no malice. He only feels that it is against his interest for me to be powerful and therefore he attacks me. But you, he hates with a bitter hatred, believing he is wronged by you. To this his companions answered that he must finish what he had to say. They were well aware of the facts, and had the deepest interest in the turn events might take. Thereupon Cyrus put his questions. Does the king suppose that you alone are his enemies, or do you know of others who hate him too? 
Certainly we do, replied the Hyrcanians. The Cadesians are his bitterest foes, and they are both numerous and warlike. Then there are the Sakians, our neighbors, who have suffered severely at his hands, but he tried to subdue them as he subdued us. Then you'd think, said Cyrus, that they would be glad to attack him in our company? Much more than glad, answered they, if they could manage to join us. And what stands in their way, asked he, the Assyrians themselves, said they, the very people among whom you are marching now. At that Cyrus turned to Gabrias. And what of this lad who is now on the throne? Did you not charge him with unbridled insolence? Even so, replied Gabrias, and I think he gave me cause. Tell me, said Cyrus, were you the only man he treated thus, or did others suffer too? Many others, said Gabrias, but some of them were weak. And why should I weary you with the insult they endured? I will tell you of a young man whose father was a much greater personage than I, and who was himself like my own son, a friend and comrade of the prince. One day at a drinking bout, this monster had the youth seized and mutilated. And why? Some say simply because a paramour of his own had praised the boy's beauty and said his bride was a woman to be envied. The king himself now asserts it was because he had tried to seduce his paramour. That young man, eunuch as he is, is now at the head of his province, for his father is dead. Well, rejoined Cyrus, I take it you believe he would welcome us, if he thought we came to help him. I am more than sure of that, said Gabrius, but it is not so easy to set eyes on him. And why? asked Cyrus because if we are to join him at all we must march right past babylon itself and where is the difficulty in that said cyrus heaven help us cried gabrias the city has only to open her gates and she can send out an army ten thousand times as large as yours that is why he added the assyrians are less prompt than they were at bringing in their weapons and their horses because those who have seen your army think it is so very small and their report has got about so that, in my opinion, it would be better to advance with the utmost care. Cyrus listened and replied, You do well, Gabrias, my friend, in urging as much care as possible, but I cannot myself see a safer route for us than the direct advance on Babylon. If Babylon is the center of the enemy's strength, they are numerous, you say, and if they are in good heart, we shall soon know it. Now, if they cannot find us and imagine that we have disappeared from fear of them, you may take it as certain that they will be quit of the terror we have inspired. Courage will spring up in its place and grow the greater the longer we lie hid. But if we march straight on then, we shall find them still mourning for the dead whom we have slain, still nursing the wounds we have inflicted, still trembling at the daring of our troops, still mindful of their own discomfiture and flight. Gabrias, he added, be assured of this. Men in the mass, when aflame with courage, are irresistible and when their hearts fail them, the more numerous they are, the worse the panic that seizes them. It comes upon them magnified by a thousand lies, blanched by a thousand pallors. It gathers head from a thousand terror-stricken looks, until it grows so great that no orator can ally it by his words. Now, by all means, let us see exactly how things stand with us. If from henceforward, victory must fall to those who can reckon the largest numbers. Your fears for us are justified, and we are indeed in fearful danger. But if the old rule still holds, and battles are decided by the qualities of those who fight, then, I say, take heart, and you will never fail. And to hearten you the more, take note of this. Our enemies are far fewer now than when we worsted them, far weaker than when they fled from us, while we are stronger because we are conquerors, and greater because fortune has been ours. Yes, and actually more numerous because you and yours have joined us, for I would not have you hold your men too low, now that they are side by side with us. In the company of conquerors, Gabrias, the hearts of the followers beat high. Nor should you forget, he added, that the enemy is well able to see us as it is, and the sight of us will certainly not be more alarming if we wait for him, when we are then if we advance against him. That is my opinion, and now you must lead us straight for Babylon. End of section 21
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader is Rosie Roberts from California. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. D. Dikins. Book 5, Chapter 3. And so the march continued, and on the fourth day they found themselves at the limit of the territory over which Gabrias ruled. Since they were now in the enemy's country, Cyrus changed the disposition of his men, taking the infantry immediately under his own command, with sufficient cavalry to support them, and sending the rest of the mounted troops to scour the land. The orders were to cut down every one with arms in his hands, and drive in the rest, with all the cattle they could find. The Persians were ordered to take part in this raid, and though many came home with nothing for their trouble but to toss from their horses, others brought back a goodly store of booty. When the spoil was all brought in, Cyrus summoned the officers of the Medes and the Hyrcanians, as well as his own peers, and spoke as follows. My friends, Gabrius has entered us nobly. He has showered good things upon us. What say you, then? After we have set aside the customary portion for the gods and a fair share for the army, shall we not give all the rest of the spoil to him? Would it not be a noble thing, a sign and symbol at the outset that we desire to outdo in well-doing those who do good to us? At that all his hearers with one consent applauded, and a certain officer rose and said, By all means, Cyrus, let us do so. I myself cannot but feel that Gabrius must have thought us almost beggars because we were not laden with coins of gold and did not drink from golden goblets. But if we do this, he will understand that men may be free and liberal without the help of gold. Come then, said Cyrus, let us pay the priest our debt to heaven, select what the army requires, and then summon Gabrius and give the rest to him. So they took what they needed and gave all the rest to Gabrius. Forwith Cyrus pressed on towards Babylon, his troops in battle order, but as the Assyrians did not come out to meet them, he bade Gabrius ride forward and deliver this message. If the king will come out to fight for his land, I, Gabrius, will fight for him, but if he will not defend his own country, we must yield to the conquerors. So Gabrius rode forward, just far enough to deliver the message in safety, and the king sent a messenger to answer him. Thy master says to thee, It repents me, Gabrius, not that I slew thy son, but that I stayed my hand from slaying thee. And now if ye will do battle, come again on the thirtieth day from hence. We have no leisure now. Our preparations are still on foot. And Gabrius made answer, It repents thee. May the repentance never cease. I have begun to make thee suffer since the day repentance took hold on thee. Then Gabrius brought back the words of the king to Cyrus, and Cyrus led his army off, and then he summoned Gabrius and said to him, Surely you told me that you thought the man who was made an eunuch by the king would be upon our side? And I am sure he will, answered Gabrius, for we have spoken freely to each other many a time. Then, said Cyrus, you must go to him when you think the right moment has come, and you must so act at first that only he and you may know what he intends and when you are closeted with him, if you find he really wishes to be a friend, you must contrive that his friendship remains a secret, for in war a man can scarcely do his friends more good than by a semblance of hostility, or his enemies more harm than under the guise of friendship. I answered Gabrius, and I know that Gadatas would pay a great price to punish the king of Assyria, but it is for us to consider what he can do best. Tell me now, rejoined Cyrus, you spoke of an outpost built against the Hyrcanians and the Sakians, which was to protect Assyria in time of war. Could the eunuch be admitted there by the commandment if he came with a force at his back? Certainly he could, if he were as free from suspicion as he is today. And free he would be, Cyrus went on, if I were to attack his stronghold as though in earnest, and he were to repel me in force. I might capture some of his men, and he some of my soldiers, or some messengers sent by me to those you say are the enemies of Assyria, and these prisoners would let it be known that they were on their way to fetch an army with scaling ladders to attack this fortress. And the eunuch, hearing their story, would pretend that he came to warn the commandment in time. Undoubtedly, said Gabrius, if things went thus, the commandment would admit him. He would even beg him to stay there until you withdrew. 
and then cyrus continued once inside the walls he could put the place into our hands we may suppose so said gabrias he would be there to settle matters within and you would be redoubling the pressure from without then be off at once said cyrus and do your best to teach him his part and when you have arranged affairs come back to me and as for pledges of good faith you could offer him none better than those you received from us yourself then gabrias made haste and was gone and the eunuch welcomed him gladly he agreed to everything and helped to arrange all that was needed presently gabrias brought back word that he thought that eunuch had everything in readiness and so without more ado cyrus made his feigned attack on the following day and was beaten off but on the other hand there was a fortress indicated by gadatus himself that cyrus took the messengers cyrus had sent out telling them exactly where to go fell into the hands of gadatus soon were allowed to escape their business was to fetch the troops and carry the scaling ladders but the rest were narrowly examined in the presence of many witnesses and when gadatus heard the object of their journey he got his equipment together and set out in the night at full speed to take the news in the end he made his way into the fortress trusted and welcomed as a deliverer and for a time he helped the commandment do the best of his ability but as soon as cyrus appeared he seized the place aided by the persian prisoners he had taken this done and having set things in order within the fortress gadatus went out to cyrus bowed before him according to the custom of his land said cyrus may joy be yours joy is mine already answered he for you god helping you have brought it to me you must know he added that i set great store by this fortress and rejoice to leave it in the hands of my allies here and for yourself gadatus he added if the assyrian has robbed you of the ability to beget children remember he has not stolen your power to win friends you have made us yours i tell you by this deed and we will stand by as faithfully as sons and grandsons of your own so cyrus spoke and at the instant the hyrcanian chief who had only just learnt what had happened came running up to him and seizing him by the hand cried out o cyrus you god send to your friends how often you make me thank the gods for bringing me to you off with you then said cyrus and occupy this fortress for which you bless me so take it and make the best use of it you can for your own nation and for all our allies and above all for gadatus our friend who won it and surrenders it to us then said the chieftain as soon as the kedishans arrive and the sakians and my countrymen we must must we not call a council of them all so that we may consult together and see how best to turn it to account cyrus thought the proposal good and when they met together it was decided to garrison the post with the common force chosen from all who were concerned that it should remain friendly and be an outer bulwark to over all the assyrians this heightened the enthusiasm of them all kedijans sakians and hyrcanians and their levies rose high until the kedijans sent in twenty thousand light infantry and four thousand cavalry and the sakians eleven thousand bowmen ten thousand on foot and one thousand mounted while the hyrcanians were free to dispatch all their reserves of infantry and make up their horsemen to a couple of thousand strong whereas previously the larger portion of their cavalry had been left at home to support the cadesians and sakians against assyria and while cyrus was kept in the fortress organizing and arranging everything many of the assyrians from the country round brought in the horses and handed over their arms being by this time in great dread of their neighbours soon after this gadatus came to cyrus and told him that messengers had come to say that the king of assyria learning what had happened to the fortress was beside himself with anger and was preparing to attack his territory if you cyrus said he will let me go now i will try to save my fortress the rest is of less account cyrus said if you go now when will you reach home and gadatus answered on the third day from this i can sup in my own house do you think asked cyrus that you will find the assyrian already there i am sure of it he answered for he will make haste while he thinks you are still far off and i said cyrus when could i be there with my army but to this gadatus made answer the army you have now my lord is very large 
and you could not reach my home in less than six days or seven well cyrus replied be off yourself make all speed and i will follow as best i can so gadatus was gone and cyrus called together all the officers of the allies and a great and goodly company they seemed noble gentlemen beautiful and brave and cyrus stood up among them all and said my allies and my friends gadatus has done deeds that we all feel worthy of high reward and that too before even he had received any benefit from us the assyrians we hear have now invaded his territory to take vengeance for the monstrous injury they consider he has done them and moreover they doubtless argue that if those who revolt to us escape scot-free while those who stand by them are cut to pieces ere long they will not have a single supporter on their side to-day gentlemen we may do a gallant deed if we rescue gadatus our friend and benefactor and truly it is only just and right thus to repay gift for gift and boon for boon moreover as it seems to me what we accomplish will be much to our own interest if all men see that we are ready to give blow for blow and sting for sting while we outdo our benefactors in generous deeds it is only natural that multitudes will long to be our friends and no man care to be our foe whereas if it be thought that we left gadatus in the lurch how in heaven's name shall we persuade another to show us any kindness how shall we dare to think well of ourselves again how shall one of us look gadatus in the face when all of us so many and so strong showed ourselves less generous than he one single man and in so sore a plight thus cyrus spoke and all of them assented right willingly and said it must be done come then concluded cyrus since you are all of one mind with me let each of us choose an escort for our wagons and beasts of burden let us leave them behind us and put gabrius at their head he is acquainted with the roads and for the rest he is a man of skill but we ourselves will push on with our stoutest men and our strongest horses taking provision for three days and no more the lighter and cheaper our gear the more gaily shall we break our fast and take our supper and sleep on the road and now said he let us arrange the order of the march you chrysantas must lead the van with your cuirassiers since the road is broad and smooth and you must put your brigadiers in the first line each regiment marching in file for if we keep close order we shall travel all the quicker and be all the safer i put the cuirassiers in the front he added because they are our heaviest troops and if the heaviest are leading the lighter cannot find it hard to follow whereas where the swiftest lead and the march is at night it is no wonder if the column fall to pieces the vanguard is always running away and behind the queer assiers he went on artabazes is to follow with the persian targeteers and the bowmen and behind them and Demias the mede with the median infantry and the embas and the armenian infantry and then artauchas with the hyrcanians and then tombradas with the sacian foot and finally datamas with the kedogians all these officers will put their brigadiers in the first line their targeteers on the right and their bowmen on the left of their own squares this is the order in which they will be of most use all the baggage bearers are to follow in the rear and their officers must see that they get everything together before they sleep and present themselves betimes in the morning with all their gear and always keep good order on the march in support of the baggage train he added there will be first medatus the persian with the persian cavalry and he too must put his brigadiers in the front each regiment following in single file as with the infantry behind them rambicus the mede and his cavalry in the same order and then you tigranes and yours and after you the other cavalry leaders with the men they brought the sakians will follow you and last of all will come the cadesians who were the last to join us and you and you alcunus who are to command them for the present you will take complete control of the rear and allow no one to fall behind your men all of you alike officers and all who respect yourselves must be most careful to march in silence at night the ears and not the eyes are the channels of information and the guides for action and at night any confusion is a far more serious matter than by day and far more difficult to put right 
for this reason silence must be studied and order absolutely maintained whenever you mean to rise before daybreak you must make the night watches as short and as numerous as possible so that no one may march because of his long vigil before it and then the hour for the start arrives the horn must be blown gentlemen i expect you all to present yourselves on the road to babylon with everything you require and as each detachment starts let them pass down the word for those in the rear to follow so the officers went to their quarters and as they went they talked to cyrus and what a marvellous memory he had always naming each officer as he assigned him his post the fact was cyrus took special pains over this it struck him as odd that the mere mechanic could know the names of all his tools and a physician the names of all his instruments but a general be such a simpleton that he could not name his own officers the very tools he had to depend on each time he wanted to seize a point or fortify a post or infuse courage or inspire terror moreover it seemed to him only courteous to address a man by name when he wished to honour him and he was sure that the man who feels he is personally known to his commander is more eager to be seen performing such noble feat of arms and more careful to refrain from all that is unseemly and base cyrus thought it would be quite foolish for him to give his orders in the style of certain householders somebody fetched the water some one split the wood after a command of that kind every one looks at every one else and no one carries it out every one is to blame and no one is ashamed or afraid because there are so many beside himself therefore cyrus always named the officers whenever he gave an order that then was his view of the matter the army now took supper and posted their guards and got their necessaries together and went to rest and at midnight the horn was blown cyrus had told chrysantas he would wait for him at a point on the road in advance of the troops and therefore he went on in front of himself with his own staff and waited till chrysantas appeared shortly afterwards at the head of his cuirassiers then cyrus put the guides under his command and told him to march on but to go slowly until he received a message for all the troops were not yet on the road this done cyrus took his stand on the line of march and as each division came up hurried it forward to its place sending messengers meanwhile to summon those who were still behind when all had started he dispatched gallopers to chrysantas to tell him that the whole army was now under way and that he might lead on as quick as he could then he galloped to the front himself reined up and quietly watched the ranks defile before him whenever a division advanced silently and in good order he would ride up and ask their names and pay them compliments and if he saw any sign of confusion he would inquire the reason and restore tranquillity one point remains to add in describing his care that night he sent forward a small but picked body of infantry active fellows all of them in advance of the whole army they were to keep chrysantas in sight and he was not to lose sight of them they were to use their ears and all their wits and report at once to chrysantas if they thought there was any need they had an officer to direct their movements announce anything of importance and not trouble about trifles thus they pressed forward through the night and when they broke cyrus ordered the mass of the cavalry to the front the ketogens alone remaining with their own infantry who brought up the rear and who were as much in need as others of cavalry support but the rest of the horsemen he sent ahead because it was ahead that the enemy lay and in case of resistance he was anxious to oppose them in battle order while if they fled he wished no time to be lost in following up the pursuit it was always arranged who were to give chase and who were to stay with himself he never allowed the whole army to be broken up thus cyrus conducted the advance but it is not to be thought that he kept to one particular spot he was always galloping backwards and forwards first at one point and then at another supervising everything and supplying any defect as it arose thus cyrus and his men marched forward end of section twenty two section twenty three of cyropedia the education of cyrus by xenophon this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Rosie Gotti Roberts from California. Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon, translated by H. G. Dakins, Book Five, Chapter Four. Now there was a certain officer in the cavalry with Gadatus, a man of power and influence, who, when he saw that his master had revolted from Assyria, thought to himself, "If anything should happen to him, I myself could get from the king all that he possessed." Accordingly, he sent forward a man he could trust with instructions that if he found the Assyrian army already in the territory of Gadatus, he was to tell the king that he could capture Gadatus and all who were with him, if he thought fit to make an ambuscade, and the messenger was also to say what force Gadatus had at his command and to announce that Cyrus was not with him. Moreover, the officer stated the road by which Gadatus was coming. Finally, to win the greater confidence, he sent word to his own dependents, and bade them deliver up to the king of Assyria the castle which he himself commanded in the province. With all that it contained, he would come himself, he added, if possible, after he had slain Gadatus, and even if he failed in that, he would always stand by the king. Now the emissary rode as hard as he could, and came before the king and told his errand. And hearing it, the king at once took over the castle and formed an ambuscade, with a large body of horse and many chariots, in a dense group of villages that lay upon the road. Gadatus, when he came near the spot, sent scouts ahead to explore, and the king, as soon as he sighted them, ordered two or three of his chariots and a handful of horsemen to dash away, as though in flight, giving the impression that they were few in number and panic-stricken. At this the scouting party swept after them, signalling to Gadatus, who also fell into the trap and gave himself up to the chase. The Assyrian waited till the quarry was within their grasp, and then sprang out from their ambuscade. The men with Gadatus, seeing what had happened, turned back and fled, with the Assyrian at their heels. While the officer who had planned it all stabbed Gadatus himself, he struck him in the shoulder, but the blow was not mortal. Thereupon the traitor fled to the pursuers, and when they found out who he was, he galloped on with them, his horse at full stretch, side by side with the king. Naturally, the men with the slower horses were overtaken by the better mounted, and the fugitives, already wearied by their long journey, were at the last extremity when suddenly they caught sight of Cyrus advancing at the head of his army, and were swept into safety as glad and thankful, we may well believe, as shipwrecked mariners into port. The first feeling of Cyrus was sheer astonishment, but he soon saw how matters stood, the whole force of the Assyrian cavalry was rolling on him, and he met it with his own army in perfect order, till the enemy, realizing what had happened, turned and fled. Then Cyrus ordered his pursuing party to charge, while he followed more slowly at the pace he thought the safest. The enemy were utterly routed, many of the chariots were taken, some had lost their charioteers, others were seized in a sudden change of front, others surrounded by the Persian cavalry. Right and the left conquerors cut down their foes, and among them fell the officer who had dealt the blow at Gadatus. But the Assyrian infantry, those who were besieging the fortress of Gadatus, escaped to the stronghold that had revolted from him, or managed to reach an important city belonging to the king, where he himself, his horsemen, and his chariots had taken refuge. After this exploit, Cyrus went on to the territory of Gadatus and as soon as he had given orders to those who guarded the prisoners, he went himself to visit the eunuch, and see how it was with him after his wound. Gadatus came out to meet him, his wound already bandaged, and Cyrus was gladdened and said, I came myself to see how it was with you. And I, said Gadatus, heaven be my witness, I came out to see how a man would look who had a soul like yours. I cannot tell what need you had of me, or what promise you ever gave me to make you do as you have done. I had shown you no kindness for your private self. It was because you thought I had been some little service to your friends that you came to help me thus, and help me you did. From death to life, left to myself, I was lost. By heaven above, I swear it, Cyrus, if I had been a father as I was born to be, God knows whether I could have found in the son of my loins so true a friend as you. I know of sons, the king of ours is such an one who has caused his own father ten thousand times more trouble than ever he causes you. And Cyrus made answer, 
You had overlooked a much more wonderful thing, Gadatas, to turn and wonder at me. Nay, said Gadatas, what could that be? That all these Persians, he answered, are so zealous in your behalf, and all these Medes and Hyrcanians and every one of our allies, Armenians, Sakians, Kedogians. Then Gadatas prayed aloud, O Father Zeus, may the gods heap blessings on them also, but above all on him who has made them what they are. And now, Cyrus, that I may entertain as they deserve these men you praise, take the gifts I bring you as their hosts, the best I have it in my power to bring. And with the word he brought out stores of every kind, enough for all to over-sacrifice who listed, and the whole army was entertained in manner worthy of their feat and their success. Meanwhile the Cadogians had been always in the rear, unable to share in the pursuit, and they longed to achieve some exploit of their own, so their chieftain, with never a word to Cyrus, led them forth alone, and raided the country toward Babylon. But as soon as they were scattered, the Assyrian came out from their city of refuge in good battle order. When they saw that the Cadigians were unsupported, they attacked them, killing the leader himself and numbers of his men, capturing many of their horses and retaking the spoil. They were in the act of driving away. The king pursued as far as he thought safe, and then turned back, and the Cadigians at last found safety in their own camp, though even the vanguard only reached it late in the afternoon. When Cyrus saw what had happened, he went out to meet them, succoring every wounded man and sending him off to Gadatus at once, to have his wounds dressed, while he helped to house the others in their quarters, and saw that they had all they needed, his peers aiding him, for at such times noble natures will give help with all their hearts. Still it was plain to see that he was sorely vexed, and when the hour for dinner came, and the others went away, he was still there on the ground with the attendants and the surgeons. Not a soul would he leave uncared for if anything could be done. He either saw to it himself or sent for the proper aid. So for that night he rested. But with daybreak Cyrus sent out a herald and summoned a gathering of all the officers and the whole Cadogian army and spoke as follows. My friends and allies, what has happened is only natural, for it is human nature to err, and I cannot find it astonishing still we may gain at least one advantage from what has occurred if we learn that we must never cut off from our main body a detachment weaker than the force of the enemy i do not say that one is never to march anywhere if necessary with an even smaller fraction than the cadogians had but before doing so you must communicate with someone able to bring up reinforcements and then though you may be trapped yourself it is at least probable that your friends behind you may foil the foilers and divert them from your own party there are fifty ways in which one can embarrass the enemy and save one's friends thus separation need not mean isolation and union with the main force may still be kept whereas if you sally forth without telling your plan you are no better off than if you were alone in the field however god willing we shall take our revenge for this year long indeed as soon as you have breakfasted i will lead you out to the scene of yesterday's skirmish and there we will bury those who fell and show our enemies that the very field where they thought themselves victorious is held by those who are stronger than they they shall never look again with joy upon the spot where they slew our comrades or else if they refuse to come out and meet us we will burn their villages and harry all their land so that in lieu of rejoicing at the sight of what they did to us they shall gnash their teeth at the spectacles of their own disasters go now said he the rest of you and take your breakfast forthwith but let the cadogians first elect a leader in accordance with their own laws and one who will guide them well and wisely and with our human help if they should need it and when you have chosen your leader and had your breakfast send him hither to me so they did as cyrus bade them and when he led the army out he stationed their new general close to his own person and told him to keep his detachment there so that you and i said he may rekindle the courage in their souls in this order they marched out and thus they buried the cadogians dead and ravaged the country which done they went back to the providence of gadatus laden with supplies taken from the foe now Cyrus felt that those who had come over to his side and who dwelt in the neighborhood of Babylon would be sure to suffer unless he were constantly there himself. And so he bade all the prisoners he set free to take a message to the king. 
and he himself dispatched a herald to say that he would leave all the tillers of the soil unmolested and unhurt if the assyrian would let those who had come over to him continue their work in peace and remember he added that even if you try to hinder my friends it is only a few whom you could stop whereas there is a vast territory of yours that i would allow to be cultivated as for the crops he added if we have war it will be the conqueror i make no doubt who will reap them but if we have peace it will be you if however any of my people take up arms against you or any of yours against me we must of course each of us defend ourselves as best we can with this message cyrus dispatched the herald and when the assyrian heard it they urged the king to accept the proposal and so limit the war as much as possible and he whether influenced by his own people or because he desired it himself consented to the terms so an agreement was drawn up proclaiming peace to the tillers of the soil and war to all who carried arms thus cyrus arranged matters for the husbandmen and he asked his own supporters among the drovers to bring their herds if they liked into his dominion and leave them there while he treated the enemy's cattle as booty wherever he could so that his allies found attraction in the campaign for the risk was no greater if they took what they needed while the knowledge that they were living at the enemy's expense certainly seemed to lighten the labor of the war when the time came for cyrus to go back and the final preparations were being made gadatus brought him gifts of every kind the produce of a vast estate and among the cattle a drove of horses taken from cavalry of his own whom he distrusted owing to the late conspiracy and when he brought them he said cyrus this day i give you these for your own and i would pray you to make such use of them as you think best but i would have you remember that all else which i call mine is yours as well for there is no son of mine nor can there ever be sprung from my own loins to whom i may leave my wealth when i die myself my house must perish with me my family and my name and i must suffer this cyrus i swear to you by the great gods above us who see all things and hear all things though never by word or deed did i commit injustice or foulness of any kind but here the words died on his lips he burst into tears over his sorrows and could say no more cyrus was touched with pity at his suffering and said to him let me accept the horses for in that i can help you if i set loyal riders on them men of better mind methinks than those who had them before and i myself can satisfy a wish that has long been mine to bring my persian cavalry up to the ten thousand men but take back i pray you all these other riches and guard them safely against the time when you may find me able to vie with you in gifts if i left you now so hugely in your debt heaven help me if i could hold up my head again for very shame there too gadatus made answer in all things i trust you and will trust you for i see your heart but consider whether i am competent to guard all this myself while i was at peace with the king the inheritance i had from my father was it may be the fairest in all the land it was near the mighty babylon and all the good things that can be gathered from a great city fell into our laps and yet from all the trouble of it the noise and the bustle we could be free at once by turning our backs and coming home here but now that we are at war, the moment you have left us, we are sure to be attacked, ourselves and all our wealth, and methinks we shall have a sorry life of it, our enemies at our elbows, and far stronger than ourselves. Why did you not think of this before you revolted? But I answer, Cyrus, because the soul within me was stung beyond endurance by my wrongs. I could not sit and ponder the safest course. I was always brooding over one idea, always in travail of one dream praying for the day of vengeance on the miscreant the enemy of god and man whose hatred never rested once aroused once he suspected a man not of doing wrong but of being better than himself and because he is a villain he will always find i know worse villain than himself to aid him but if one day a nobler rival should appear have no concern cyrus you will never need to do battle with such an one yonder fiend would deal with him and to work me trouble and disaster he and his wicked tools will i fear me have strength enough and to spare cyrus thought 
There was much in what he said, and he answered forthwith, Tell me, Gadotus, did we not put a stout garrison in your fortress, so as to make it safe for you whenever you needed it? And are you not taking the field with us now, so that if the gods be on our side as they are today, that scoundrel may fear you, not you him? Go now, bring with you all you have that is sweet to look on and to love, and then join our march. You shall be, I am persuaded, of the utmost service to me, and I, so far as in me lies, will give you help for help. When Gadatus heard that, he breathed again, and he said, Could I really be in time to make my preparations and be back before you leave? I would fain take my mother with me on the march. Assuredly, said Cyrus, you will be in time, for I will wait until you say that all is ready. So it came to pass that Gadatus went his way and with the aid of Cyrus put a strong garrison in his fortress, and got together the wealth of his broad estate, and moreover he brought with him in his own retinue servants he could trust, and in whom he took delight, as well as many others in whom he put no trust at all, and these he compelled to bring their wives with them, and their sisters, that so they might be bound to his service. Thus Gadatus went with Cyrus, and Cyrus kept him ever at his side, to show him the roads and the places for water and fodder and food, and led them where there was most abundance. At last they came in sight of Babylon once more, and it seemed to Cyrus that the road they were following led under the very walls. Therefore he summoned Gobrias and Gadatus and asked them if there was not another way, so that he need not pass so close to the ramparts. There are many other ways, my lord, answered Gobrias, but I thought you would certainly want to pass as near the city as possible, and display the size and splendor of your army to the king. I knew that when your force was weaker you advanced to his walls, and let him see us, few as we were, and I am persuaded that if he had made any preparation for battle now, as he said he would when he sees the power you have brought with you, he will think once more that he is unprepared. But Cyrus said, Does it seem strange to you, Gobrias, that when I had a far smaller army I took it right up to the enemy's wall, and today, when my force is greater, I will not venture there. You need not think it strange. To march up is not the same as to march past. Every leader will march up with his troops, disposed in the best order for battle, and a wise leader will draw them off so as to secure safety rather than sped. But in marching past, there is no means of avoiding long straggling lines of wagons, long strings of baggage bearers, and all these must be screened by the fighting force so as never to leave the baggage unprotected. But this must mean a thin, weak order for the fighting men, and if the enemy choose to attack at any point with their full force, they can strike with far more weight than any of the troops available to meet them at the moment. Again, the length of line means a long delay in bringing up relief, whereas the enemy have only a hand's breath to cover as they rush out from the walls or retire. But now, if we leave a distance between ourselves and them, as wide as our line is long, not only with they realize our numbers plainly enough, but our veil of glittering armor will make the whole multitude more formidable in their eyes. And if they do attack us anywhere, we shall be able to foresee their advance a long way off and be quite prepared to give them welcome. But it is far more likely, gentlemen, he added, that they will not make the attempt with all that ground to cover from the walls unless they imagine that their whole force is superior to the whole of ours they know that retreat will be difficult and dangerous so cyrus spoke and his listeners felt that he was right and gobrias led the army by the way that he advised and as detachment after another passed the city cyrus strengthened the protection for the rear and so withdrew in safety Marching in this order, he came back at last to his first starting point, on the frontier between Assyria and Media. Here he dealt with three Assyrian fortresses. One, the weakest, he attached and took by force, while the garrisons of the other two, what with the eloquence of Gadatus and the terror inspired by Cyrus, were persuaded to surrender. End of section 23《Section 20 of Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Rosie Roberts from California. Cyropedia. The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Deccans. Book 5, Chapter 5. And now that his expedition was completed, Cyrus sent to Xeraxeres and urged him to come to the camp in order that they might decide best how to use the forts which they had taken. And perhaps Xeraxeres, after reviewing the army, would advise him what the next move ought to be. Or Cyrus added to the messenger, If he bids me, say I will come to him and take up my encampment there. So the emissary went off with the message, and meanwhile Cyrus gave orders that the Assyrian tent chosen for Xeraxeres should be furnished as splendidly as possible, and the woman brought to her apartment there, and the two singing girls also, whom they had set aside for him. And while they were busied with these things, the envoy went to Xeraxeres and delivered his message, and Xeraxeres listened and decided it was best for Cyrus and his men to stay on the frontier. The Persians whom Cyrus had sent for had already arrived, 40,000 bowmen and targeteers. To watch these eating up the land was bad enough, and Xeraxeres thought he would rather be quit of one horde before he received another. On his side, the officer in command of the Persian levy, following the instructions from Cyrus, asked Xeraxeres if he had any need of the men, and Xeraxeres said he had not. And Xeraxeres said he had not. Thereupon, and hearing that Cyrus had arrived, the Persian put himself at the head of his troops and went off at once to join him. Xeraxeres himself waited till the next day and then set out with the Median troopers who had stayed behind. And when Cyrus knew of his approach, he took his Persian cavalry, who were now a large body of men, and all the Medes, Hyrcanians, and Armenians, and the best mounted and best armed among the rest, and so went out to meet Xeraxeres and show the power he had won. But when Xeraxeres saw so large a following of gallant gentlemen with Cyrus, and with himself so small and mean a retinue, it seemed to him an insult, and mortification filled his heart. And when Cyrus sprang from his horse and came up to give him the kiss of greeting, Xeraxeres thought he dismounted, turned away his head, and gave him no kiss, while the tears came into his eyes. Whereupon Cyrus told the others to stand aside and rest, and then he took Xeraxerus by the hand and led him apart under a grove of palm trees, and bade the attendants spread median carpets for them, and made Xeraxerus sit down, and then seating himself beside him, he said, Uncle of mine, tell me, in heaven's name, I implore you, why are you angry with me? What bitter sight have you seen to make you feel such bitterness? And then Xeraxerus answered, Listen, Cyrus, I have been reputed royal and of royal lineage, as far back as the memory of man can go. My father was a king, and a king I myself was thought to be. And now I see myself riding here, meanly and miserably attended, while you come before me in splendor and magnificence, followed by the retinue that once was mine and all your other forces. That would be bitter enough, methinks, from the hand of an enemy. But, O oh gods above us, how much more bitter at the hands of those from whom we least deserve it. Far rather would I be swallowed in the earth than live to be seen so low, I, and to see my own kinsfolk turn against me and make a mock of me. And well I know, said he, that not only you, but my own slaves are now stronger and greater than myself. They come out equipped to do me far more mischief than ever I could repay. But here he stopped, overcome by a passion of weeping, so much so that for very pity Cyrus's own eyes filled with tears. There was silence between them for a while, and then Cyrus said, Nay, Xeraxeres, what you say is not true, and what you think is not right. If you imagine that because I am here, your Medes have been equipped to do you any harm. I do not wonder that you are pained, and I will not ask if you have caused or not for your anger against them. You will ill brook apologies for them from me. Only it seems to me a grievous error in a ruler to quarrel with all his subjects at once, 
widespread terror must needs be followed by widespread hate anger with all creates unity among all it was for this reason take my word for it that i would not send them back to you without myself fearing that your wrath might be the cause of what would injure all of us through my presence here and by the blessing of heaven all is safe for you but that you should regard yourself as wronged by me i cannot but feel it bitter when i am doing all in my power to help my friends to be accused of plotting against them however he continued let us not accuse each other in this useless way if possible let us see exactly in what i have offended and as between friend and friend i will lay down the only rule that is just and fair if i can be shown to have done you harm i will confess i am to blame but if it appears that i have never injured you not even in thought will you not acquit me of all injustice towards you needs must i answered zaraxerus and if i can show that i have done you service and been zealous in your cause to the utmost of my power may i not claim instead of rebuke some little meed of praise that were only fair said zaraxerus then said cyrus let us go through all i have done point by point and see what is good in it and what is evil let us begin from the time when i assumed my generalship if that is early enough i think i am right in saying that it was because you saw your enemies gathering together against you and ready to sweep over your land and you that you sent to persia asking for help and to me in private praying me to come if i could myself at the head of any forces they might send was i not obedient to your word did i not come myself with the best and bravest i could bring you did indeed answered zaraxerus tell me then before we go further did you see any wrong in this was it not rather a service and a kindly act certainly said zaraxerus so far as that went i saw nothing but kindliness well after the enemy had come and we had to fight the matter out did you ever see me shrinking from toil or try to escape from danger that i never did said zaraxerus quite the contrary and afterwards then through the help of heaven victory was ours and the enemy retreated and i implored you to let us pursue them together take vengeance on them together win together the fruits of any gallant exploit we might achieve can you accuse me then of self-seeking or self-aggrandizement but at that zaraxerus was silent then cyrus spoke again if you would rather not reply to that tell me if you thought yourself injured because when you considered pursuit unsafe i relieved you of the risk and only begged you to lend me some of your cavalry if my offence lay in asking for that when i had already offered to work with you side by side you must prove it to me and it will need some eloquence he paused but zaraxerus still kept silence nay said cyrus if you will not answer that either tell me at least if my offence lay in what followed when you said that you did not care to stop your means in their merrymaking and drive them out into danger do you think it was wrong in me without waiting to quarrel on that score to ask you for what i knew was the lightest boon you could grant and the lightest command you could lay on your soldiers for i only asked that he who wished it might be allowed to follow me and thus when i had won your permission i had won nothing unless i could win them too therefore i went and tried persuasion and some listened to me and with these i set off on my march holding my commission from your own self so that if you look on this act as blameworthy it would seem that not even the acceptance of your own gifts can be free from blame it was thus we started and after we had gone was there i ask you a single deed of mine that was not done in the light of day has not the enemy's camp been taken have not hundreds of your assailants fallen and hundreds been deprived on their horses and their arms is not the spoiler spoiled the cattle and the goods of those who harried your land are now in the hands of your friends they are brought to you or to your subjects and above all and beyond all you see your own country growing great and powerful and the land of your enemy brought low 
strongholds of his are in your power and your own that were torn from you in other days by the syrian domination are now restored to you again i cannot say i should be glad to learn that any of these things can be bad for you or short of good but i am ready to listen if so it is speak tell me your judgment of it all then cyrus paused and zaraxerus made answer to call what you have done evil cyrus is impossible but your benefits are of such a kind that the more they multiply upon me the heavier burden do they bring i would far rather he went on have made your country great by own power than see mine exalted this way by you these deeds of yours are a crown of glory to you but they bring dishonor to me and for the wealth i would rather have made largest of it to yourself than receive it at your hands in the way you give it now good so gotten only leave me the poorer and for my subjects i think i would have suffered less if you had injured them a little than i suffer now when i see how much they owe you perhaps he added you find it inhuman of me to feel thus but i would ask you to forget me and imagine that you are in my place and see how it would appear to you then suppose a friend of yours were to take care of your dogs dogs that you bred up to guard yourself and your house such care that he made them fonder of him than of yourself would you be pleased with him for his attention or take another instance if that one seems too slight suppose a friend of yours were to do so much for your own followers men you kept to guard you and to fight for you that they would rather serve in his train than yours would you be grateful to him for his kindness or let me take the tenderest of human ties suppose a friend of yours paid court to the wife of your bosom so that in the end he made her love him more than yourself would he rejoice your heart by his courtesy far from it i trow he who did this you would say did you the greatest wrong in all the world and now to come nearest to my own case suppose some one paid such attention to your persians that they learnt to follow him instead of you would you reckon that man your friend no but a worse enemy than if he had slain a thousand or again say you spoke in all friendship to a friend and bade him take what he wished and straightway he took all he could lay hands on and carried it off and so grew rich with your wealth and you were left in utter poverty could you say that friend was altogether blameless and i cyrus i feel that you have treated me if not in that way yet in a way exactly like it what you say is true enough i did allow you to take what you liked and go and you took the whole of my power and went leaving me desolate and to-day you bring the spoil you have won with my forces and lay it so grandly at my feet magnificent and you make my country great through the help of my own might while i have no part or lot in the performance but must step in at the end like a woman to receive your favours while in the eyes of all men not least my faithful subjects yonder you are the man and i i am not fit to wear a crown are these i ask you cyrus are these the deeds of a benefactor nay had you been kind as you are kin above all else you would have been careful not to rob me of my dignity and honour what advantage is it to me for my lands to be made broad if i myself am dishonoured when i ruled the medes i ruled them not because i was stronger than all of them but because they themselves thought that our race was in all things better than theirs but while he was still speaking cyrus broke in on his words crying uncle of mine by the heavens above us if i have ever shown you any kindness be kind to me now do not find fault with me any more wait and put me to the test and learn how i feel towards you and if you see that what i have done has really brought you good then when i embrace you embrace me in return and call me your benefactor and if not you may blame me as you please perhaps answered sir axerus you are right i will do as you wish then i may kiss you said cyrus yes if it pleases you and you will not turn aside as you did just now no i will not turn aside and he kissed him and when the medes saw it and the persians and all the allies 
for all were watching to see how matters would shape. Joy came into their hearts, and gladness lit up their faces. Then Cyrus and Zaraxorus mounted their horses and rode aback, and the Medes fell behind Zaraxorus at a nod from Cyrus. And behind Cyrus, the Persians, and the others behind them, and when they reached the camp and brought Zaraxorus to the splendid tent, those who were appointed made everything ready for him, and while he was waiting for the banquet, his Medes presented themselves, some of their own accord. It is true, but most were sent by Cyrus, and they brought him gifts. One came with a beautiful cupbearer, another with an admirable cook, a third with a baker, a fourth with a musician, while others brought cups and goblets and beautiful apparel. Almost every one gave something out of the spoils they had won, so that the mood of Xaraxerus changed, and he seemed to see that Cyrus had not stolen his subjects from him, and that they made no less account of him than they used to do. Now when the hour came for the banquet, Xaraxerus sent to Cyrus and begged him to share it. It was so long, he said, since they had met, but Cyrus answered, Bid me not to the feast, good uncle. Do you not see that all these soldiers of ours have been raised by us to the pitch of expectation? And it were ill on my part if I seem to neglect them for the sake of my private pleasure. If soldiers feel themselves neglected, even the good become faint-hearted, and the bad grow insolent. With yourself it is different. You have come a long journey, and you must fall to without delay. And if your subjects do you honour, welcome them and give them good cheer, that there may be confidence between you and them. But I must go and attend to the matters of which I speak. Early tomorrow morning, he added, our chief officers will present themselves at your gate to hear from you what you think our next step ought to be. You will tell us whether we ought to pursue the campaign further or whether the time has now come to disband our army. Thereupon Xaraxerus betook himself to the banquet, and Cyrus called the council of his friends. The shrewdest and the best fitted to act with him, and spoke to them as follows. My friends, thank to the gods our first praise are granted. Wherever we set foot now, we are the masters of the country. We see our enemies brought low and ourselves increasing day by day in numbers and in strength. And if only our present allies would consent to stay with us a little longer, our achievements could be greater still, whether forces were needed or persuasion. Now it must be your work as much as mine to make as many of them as possible willing and anxious to remain. Remember that, just as the soldier who overthrows the greatest number in the day of battle is held to be the bravest. So the speaker when the time has come for persuasion, who brings most men to his side will be thought the most eloquent, the best orator, and a blessed man of action. Do not, however, prepare your speeches as though we asked you to give a rhetorical display. Remember that those whom you convince will show it well enough by what they do. I leave you then, he added, to the careful study of your parts. Mine is to see so far as in me lies, that our troops are provided with all they need before we hold the council of war. End of Book 5, Chapter 5 Your reader has been Rosie Roberts from California. Section 25 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon Translated by H. G. Dakins Book 6, Chapter 1 So the day ended, and they supped and went to rest. But early the next morning all the allies flocked to Cyaxares' gates. And while Cyaxares dressed and adorned himself, hearing that a great multitude were waiting, Cyrus gave audience to the suitors his own friends had brought. 
First came the Kadoshians, imploring him to stay, and then the Hyrcanians, and after them the Sakians, and then someone presented Gobrias, and Histapus brought in Gadatas, the eunuch, whose entreaty was still the same. At that Cyrus, who knew already that for many a day Gadatas had been half dead with fear, lest the army should be disbanded, laughed outright and said, Ah, Gadatas, you cannot conceal it. You have been bribed by my friend Histapus to take this view. But Gadatas lifted up his hands to heaven and swore most solemnly that Histapus had not influenced him. Nay, said he, it is because I know myself that if you depart, I am ruined utterly. And therefore it was that I took it upon me to speak with Histapus myself and ask him if he knew what was in your mind about the disbanding of the army. And Cyrus said, it would be unjust then, I suppose, to lay the blame on Histapus. Yes, Cyrus, most unjust, said Histapus, for I only said to Gadatas that it would be impossible for you to carry on the campaign, as your father wanted you home and had sent for you. What? cried Cyrus. You dared to let it be known whether I wished it or not? Certainly I did, he answered, for I can see that you are mad to be home in Persia the cynosure of every eye, telling your father how you wrought this and accomplished that. Well, said Cyrus, you are not longing to go home yourself? No, said the other, I am not, nor have I any intention of going. Here I shall stay and be the general-in-chief until I make our friend Geratas the lord and the Syrian his slave. Thus, half in jest and half in earnest, they played with one another, and meanwhile Cyaxares had finished adorning himself and came forth in great splendor and solemnity, and sat down on a Median throne. And when all were assembled and silence was proclaimed, Cyaxares said, My friends and allies, perhaps since I am present and older than Cyrus, it is suitable that I should address you first. It appears to me that the moment has come to discuss one question before all others, the question whether we ought to go on with the campaign or disband the army. Be pleased, he added, to state your opinions on the matter. Then the leader of the Hyrcanians stood up at once and said, Friends and allies, I hardly think the words are needed when facts themselves show us the path to take. All of us know that while we stand together we give our enemy more trouble than we get, but when we stood alone it was they who dealt us as they liked best, and we liked least. Then the Kardashian followed. The less we talk, said he, about breaking up and going home separately, the better. Separation has done us anything but good. It seems to me, even on the march, my men and I, at any rate, very soon paid the penalty for private excursions, as I dare say you have not forgotten. Upon that, Artabazus rode, the Mede who had claimed kinship with Cyrus in the old days. Cyaxares, said he, in one respect I differ from those who have spoken before me. They think we should stay here in order to go on with the campaign, but I think I am always on campaign at home. I was forever out on some expedition or another, because our people were being harried, our fortress threatened, and a world of trouble I had, what with fears within and fighting without, and all too at my expense. As it is now I occupy the enemy's forts, my fear of them is gone, I make good cheer on their own good things, and I drink their own good wine. Since home means fighting and service here means feasting, I am not in favor myself, said he of breaking up the company. Then Gobrias spoke. Friends, said he, I have trusted Cyrus's word and had no fault to find with him. What he promises, that he performs. But if he leaves the country now, the Assyrian will be reprieved. He will never be punished for the wrongs he tried to inflict on you and did inflict on me. I shall be punished instead, because I have been your friend. But if he leaves the country now, the Assyrians will be reprieved. He will never be punished for the wrongs he tried to inflict on you and did inflict on me. At that Cyrus rode at last and said, 
Gentlemen, I am aware that the disbanding of our forces must mean the decrease of our power and the increase of theirs. If some of them have given up their weapons, they will soon procure others. If some have lost their horses, the loss will soon be made good. If some have fallen in battle, others, younger and stronger, will take their place. We need not be surprised if they are soon in a condition to cause us trouble again. Why, then, did I ask Cyaxares to put the question to debate? Because, I answer, I am afraid of the future. I see opponents against us whom we cannot fight if we conduct the campaign as we are doing now. Winter is advancing against us, and though we may have shelter for ourselves, we have nothing. Heaven knows, for our horses and our servants and the great mass of our soldiery, without whom we cannot even think of a campaign. As to provisions? Up to the limits of our advance, and because of that advance, they have been exhausted. And beyond that line, owing to the terror we inspire, the inhabitants will have stowed their supplies away in strong places where they can enjoy them and we cannot get them. Where is the warrior, stout of heart and strong of will, who can wage war with cold and hunger? If our style of soldiering is only what has been, I say we ought to disband at once of our own accord, and not wait to be driven from the field against our will by sheer lack of means. If we do wish to go forward, this is what we must do. We must detach from the enemy all fortresses we can, and secure all we can for our own. If this is done, the larger supply will be in the hands of those who can stow away the larger store, and the weaker will suffer siege. At present we are like mariners in the ocean. They may sail on forever, but the seas they have crossed are no more theirs than those that are still unsailed. But if we hold the fortresses, the enemy will find they are living in a hostile land, while we have halcyon weather. Some of you may dread the thought of garrison duty far from home. If so, dispel your doubts. We Persians, who must, as it is, be exiles for the time, will undertake the positions that are nearest to the foe, while it will be for you to occupy the land on the marshes between Assyria and yourselves and put it under tillage. For if we can hold this inner line, your peace will not be disturbed by the outlying parts. He will scarcely neglect the danger at his door to attack you out in the distance. At this the whole assembly rose to express their eagerness and assent, and Cyaxares stood up with them, and both Garatas and Gobrias offered to fortify a post if the allies wished, and thus provide two cities of refuge to start with. Finally, Cyrus, thus assured of the general consent of his proposals, said, if we really wish to carry out what we have set ourselves, we must prepare battering rams and siege engines, and get together mechanics and builders for our own castles. Thereupon, Cyaxares at once undertook to provide an engine at his own expense. Gadatas and Gobrias made themselves responsible for a second, Tigranes a third, and Cyrus himself promised he would try to furnish two. That done, every one set to work to find engineers and artisans, and to collect material for the machines, and superintendents were appointed from the best qualified for the work. Now Cyrus was aware that all this would take some time, and therefore he encamped his troops in the healthiest spot he could find, and the easiest to supply, strengthening, whenever necessary, the natural defenses of the place, so that the detachment left in charge for the time should always be in complete security, even though he might be absent himself with the main body of his force. Nor was this all. He questioned those who knew the country best, and, learning where he would be rewarded for his pains, he would lead his men out to forage, and thus procure as large supplies as possible keep his soldiers in the best health and strength, and fix their drill in their minds. So Cyrus spent his days, and meanwhile the deserters from Babylon and the prisoners who were captured all told them the same story. They said that the king had gone off to Lydia, 
taking with him store of gold and silver and riches and treasures of every kind the mass of the soldiers were convinced that he was storing his goods away from fear but cyrus knew that he must have gone to raise if possible an opponent who could face them and therefore he pushed his preparations forward vigorously feeling that another battle must be fought he filled up the persian cavalry till its full complement getting the horses partly from the prisoners partly from his own friends there were two gifts he would never refuse horses and good weapons he also procured chariots taking them from the enemy or wherever he could find them the old trojan style of charioteering still in use to this day among the cyrenians he abolished before his time the medes the syrians the arabians and all asiatics generally used their chariots in the same way as the cyrenians do now the fault of the system to his mind was that the very flower of the army if the picked men were in the chariots would only act at long range and so contribute little after all to the victory three hundred chariots meant twelve hundred horses and three hundred fighting men besides the charioteers who would naturally be men above the common in whom the warriors could place confidence and that meant another three hundred debarred from injuring the enemy in any kind of way such was the system he abolished in favor of the war chariot proper with strong wheels to resist shock of collision and long axles on the principle that a broad base is the firmer while the driver's seat was changed to what might be called a turret stoutly built of timber and reaching up to the elbow leaving the driver open to manage the horses above the rim the drivers themselves were all fully armed only their eyes uncovered he had iron scythes about two feet long attached to the axles on either side and others under the tree pointing to the ground for use in a charge such was the type of chariot invented by cyrus and it is still in use today among the subjects of the great king beside the chariots he had a large number of camels collected from his friends or captured from the enemy moreover he decided to send a spy to lydia to ascertain the movements of the king and he thought that the right man for this purpose was eraspas the officer in charge of the fair lady from susa matters had gone ill with eraspas he had fallen passionately in love with his prisoner and had been led to entreat her to be his paramour she had refused faithful to her husband who was far away for she loved him dearly but she forbore to accuse eraspas to cyrus being unwilling to set friend at strife with friend but when at length eraspas thinking it would help him in his desires began to threaten her saying that if she would not yield he would have his will of her by force then in her dread of violence she could keep the matter hid no longer and she sent her eunuch to Cyrus with orders to tell him everything. And when Cyrus heard it, he smiled over the man who had boasted that he was superior to love, and sent Artabazus back with the eunuch to tell Eraspus that he must use no violence against such a woman, but if he could persuade her, he might do so. But Artabazus, when he saw Eraspus, rebuked him sternly, saying that the woman was a sacred trust and his conduct disgraceful impious and wicked till eraspus burst into tears of misery and shame and was half dead at the thought of what cyrus would do learning this cyrus sent for him saw him alone and said to him face to face eraspus i know you are afraid of me and in agony of shame be comforted we are told that the gods themselves are made subject to desire and I could tell you what love has forced some men to undergo, men who seemed most lofty and most wise. Did I not pass sentence on myself when I confessed that I was too weak to consort with loveliness and remain unmoved? Indeed, it is I who am most to blame in the matter, for I shut you up myself with this irresistible power. But Eraspus broke on his words. Ah, Cyrus, you are ever the same, gentle and compassionate to human weakness but all the rest of the world has no pity on me they drown me in wretchedness as soon as all the tattlers got wind of my misfortune 
all my enemies exalted, and all my friends came to me, advising me to make away with myself for fear of you, because my iniquity was so great. Then Cyrus said, Now listen, this opinion about you may be the means by which you can do me a great kindness and your comrades a great service. Oh, that it were possible, said Araspas, for me ever to be of service to you. Well, said the other, if you went to the enemy, feigning that you had fled from me, I think that they would believe you. I'm sure that they would, said Araspas. I know even my own friends would think, of course, I ran away. Then you will come back to us, Cyrus went on, with full information about the enemy's affairs, for if I am right in my expectation, they will trust you and let you see all their plans, so that you need miss nothing of what we wish to know. I will be off this moment, said Araspas. It will be my best credential to have it thought that I was just in time to escape punishment from you. Then you can really bring yourself to leave the beautiful Panthea? Yes, Cyrus, he answered. I can, for I see now that we have two souls. This is the lesson of philosophy I have learnt from the wicked sophist love. If we had but a single soul, how could she be at once evil and good? How could she be enamoured at once of nobleness and baseness, or at once desire and not desire, one deed and the same? No. It is clear that we have two souls, and when the beautiful soul prevails, all fair things are wrought, and when the evil soul has the mastery, she lays her hand to shame and wickedness. But today my good soul conquers, because she has you to help her. Well, said Cyrus, if you have decided on going, it is thus you had better go. Thus you will win their confidence, and then you must tell them what we are doing but in such a way as to hinder their own designs. It would hinder them, for example, if you said that we were preparing an attack on their territory at a point not yet decided, for this would check the concentration of their forces, each leader being most concerned for the safety of his own home. Stay with them, he added, till the last moment possible. What they do when they are close at hand is just what is most important for us to know. Advise them how to dispose their forces in a way that really seems the best, for then, after you have gone, and although it may be known that you are aware of their order, they will be forced to keep it, and they will not dare change it, and should they do so at the last moment, they will be thrown into confusion. Thereupon Araspas took his leave, calling together his trustiest attendants, said what he thought was necessary for the occasion, and departed. Now Panthea, when she heard that Araspas had fled, sent a messenger to Cyrus, saying, Grieve not, Cyrus, that Araspas has gone to join the foe. I will bring you a far trustier friend than he. If you will let me send for my husband, I know he will bring with him all the power that he has. It is true that the old king was my husband's friend, but he who reigns now tried to tear us two asunder, and my husband knows him for a tyrant and a miscreant, and would gladly be quit of him and take service with such a man as you. When Cyrus heard that, he bade Panthea send word to her husband, and she did so. Now when Abradates saw the tokens from his wife, and learned how matters stood, he was full of joy, and sent out for Cyrus's camp immediately, with a thousand horsemen in his train. And when he came to the Persian outposts, he sent to Cyrus, saying who he was, and Cyrus gave orders that he should be taken to Panthea forthwith. So husband and wife met again after hope had well nigh vanished, and were in each other's arms once more. And when Panthea spoke of Cyrus, his nobleness, his honour, and the compassion he had shown her, and Abradatis cried, Tell me, tell me, how can I repay him all I owe him in your name and mine? And she answered, So deal with him, my husband as he is dealt with you. And thus Abradatus went to Cyrus, and took him by hand, and said, Cyrus, in return for the kindness you have shown us, I can say no more than this. I give myself to you, I will be your friend, your servant, and your ally. 
Whatever you desire, I will help you to win. Your fellow worker always, so far as in me lies. Then Cyrus answered, And I will take your gift. But for the moment you must leave me, and sup with your wife. Another day will let me play the host, and give you lodging with your friends and mine. Afterwards, Aurodatus perceived how much Cyrus had at heart the scythe-bearing chariots and the cavalry, and the war-horses with all their armor, and he resolved to equip a hundred chariots for him out of his own cavalry force. Thus he proposed to lead himself in a chariot of his own, four pulled and drawn by eight horses, all the eight protected by chest plates of bronze. So Abradatis set to work, and this four-pulled chariot of his gave Cyrus the idea of making a car with eight poles, drawn by eight yoke of oxen to carry the lowest compartment of the battering engines, which stood, with its wheels, about twenty-seven feet from the ground. Cyrus felt that if he had a series of such towers brought into the field at a fair pace, they would be of immense service to him, and inflict as much damage on the enemy. The towers were built with galleries and parapets, and each of them could carry twenty men. When the whole was put together, he tested it and found that the eight yoke of oxen could draw the whole tower with the men more easily than one yoke by itself could manage the ordinary weight of baggage, which came to about five and twenty talons apiece, whereas the tower, built of planks about as thick as the boards for a stage, weighed less than fifteen for each yoke. Thus, having satisfied himself that the attempt was perfectly possible, he arranged to take the towers into action, believing that in war selfishness meant salvation, justice, and happiness. End of section 25 Section 26 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon Translated by H. G. Dakins Book 6, Chapter 2 About this time, ambassadors came to Cyrus from India with gifts of courtesy and a message from their king, saying, I send you greeting, Cyrus, and I rejoice that you have told me of your needs. I desire to be your friend, and I offer you gifts. And if you have need of anything more, I bid you say the word, and it shall be yours. I have told my men to do whatever you command. Then Cyrus answered, this, then, is my bidding. The rest of you shall stay where you have pitched your tents. You shall guard your treasures and live as you choose. But three of you shall go to the enemy and make believe that you have come to him about an alliance with your king. And thus you shall learn how matters stand, and all they say and all they do. And so bring me word again with speed. And if you serve me well in this, I shall owe you even more than I could owe you for these gifts. There are some spies who are no better than slaves, and have no skill to find anything more than is known already, but there are men of another sort, men of your stamp, who can discover plans that are not yet disclosed. The Indians listened gladly, and for a moment made themselves at home as guests of Cyrus. But the next day they got ready and set off on their journey, promising to find out as much as they could of the enemy's secrets and bring him word again with all possible speed. Meanwhile, Cyrus continued his preparations for the war on a magnificent scale, like one who meant to accomplish no small achievement. Not only did he carry out the resolutions of his allies, but he breathed a spirit of emulation into his own friends and followers, till each strove to outshine his fellows in arms and accoutrements in horsemanship and spearmanship and archery, in endurance of toil and danger. Cyrus would lead them out to the chase and show especial honor to those who distinguished themselves in any way. He would whet the ambition of the officers by praising all who did their best to improve their men and by gratifying them in every way he could. At every sacrifice and festival, 
he instituted games and contests and all martial exercises and lavished prizes on the victors till the whole army was filled with enthusiasm and confidence by this time cyrus had almost everything in readiness for the campaign except the battering machines the persian cavalry was made up to its full number of ten thousand men and the scythe chariots were complete a hundred of his own and a hundred of Aradatas of susa had provided beside these there were a hundred of the old median chariots which cyrus had persuaded cyaxares to remodel in his own type giving up the trojan and lydian style the camels were ready also each animal carrying a couple of mounted archers the bulk of the great army felt almost as though they had already conquered and the enemy's power was held of no account while matters were thus the indians whom cyrus had sent out returned with their report croesus had been chosen leader and general-in-chief a resolution had been passed calling on all the allied kings to bring up their entire forces raise enormous sums for the war and spend them hiring in mercenaries where they could and making presents where they must large numbers of thracians armed with the short sword had already been enrolled and a body of egyptians were coming by sea amounting so said the indians to one hundred and twenty thousand men armed with long shields reaching to their feet huge spears such as they carry to this day and sabres beside these an army was expected from cyprus and there were already on the spot all the sicilians the men both from the phrygians of lysonia paphlagonia and cappadocia the arabians the phoetians and all the assyrians under the king of babylon moreover the ionians the aeolians and indeed nearly all the hellenic colonists on the coast were compelled to follow the train of croesus croesus himself had already sent to lacedaemon to propose an alliance with the spartans the armament was mustering on the banks of pactolus and they were to push forward presently to thimbrara the place which was still mustering ground for all the asiatic subjects of the great king west of syria and orders had been issued to open a market there this report agreed with accounts given by the prisoners for cyrus was always at pains to gave men captured from whom he could get some information and who would also send out spies disguised as runaway slaves such were the tidings and when the army heard the news there was much anxiety and concern as one may well suppose the men went about their work with unusual quietness their faces clouded over or gathered in knots and clusters everywhere anxiously asking each other the news and discussing the report when cyrus saw that fear was in the camp he called a meeting of his generals and indeed of all whose dejection might injure the cause and whose confidence assist it moreover he sent word that any of the attendants or any of the rank and file who wished to hear what he had to say would be allowed to come and listen when they met he spoke as follows my friends and allies i make no secret of the reason i have called you here it was because i saw that some of you when the reports of the enemy reached us looked like men who were panic-stricken but i must say i am astonished that any of you should feel alarm because the enemy is mustering his forces and not be reassured by remembering that our own is far larger than it was when we conquered him before and far better provided under heaven with all we need i ask how you would have felt you who are afraid now if you had been told that a force exactly like our own was marching upon us if you had heard that men who had conquered us already were coming now carrying in their hearts the victory they had won if you knew that those who made short work then of all our bows and javelins were advancing again and others with them ten thousand times as many suppose you heard that the men who had routed our infantry once were coming on now equipped as before but this time on horseback scorning arms and javelins each man armed with one stout spear ready to charge home suppose you heard of chariots made on a new pattern 
not to be kept motionless, standing, as hitherto, with their backs turned to the foe as if for flight, but with the horses shielded by armor, and the drivers sheltered by wooden walls, and protected by breastplates and helmets, and the axles fitted with iron scythes, so that they can charge straight into the ranks of the foe? And suppose you heard that they have camels to ride on, each one of which would scare a hundred horses, and that they would bring up towers from which to help their own friends, and overwhelm us with volleys of darts, so that we cannot fight them on level ground? If this were what you had heard of the enemy, I as you, once again, you who are now so fearful, what would you have done? You who turned pale when I told that Croatius has been chosen commander-in-chief, Croatius who proved himself so much more cowardly than the Syrians, that when they were worsted in battle and fled, instead of helping them, his own allies, he took to his heels himself. We are told, moreover, that the enemy himself does not feel equal to facing you alone. He is hiring others to fight for him better than he could for himself. I can only say, gentlemen, that if any individual considers our position as I describe it alarming or unfavorable, he had better leave us. Let him join our opponents. He will do us far more service there than here. When Cyrus had ended, Chrysanthus, the Persian, stood up and said, Cyrus, you must not wonder if the faces of some were clouded when they heard the news. The cloud was a sign of annoyance, not fear, just as if, he went on, a company were expecting breakfast immediately, and then they were told there was some business that must be got through first. I do not suppose any of them would be particularly pleased. Here we were, saying to ourselves that our fortunes were made, and now we are informed that there is still something to be done. And of course, our countenances fell, not because we were afraid, but because we would have wished it all over and done with. However, since it now appears that Syria is not to be the only prize, though there is much to be got in Syria, flocks and herds and corn and palm trees yielding fruit, but Lydia as well, Lydia the land of wine and oil and fig trees, Lydia, to whose shores the sea brings more good things than eyes can feast on, I say that once we realize this we can mope no longer, our spirits will rise apace, and we shall hasten to lay our hands on the Lydian wealth without delay. So he spoke, and the allies were well pleased at his words and gave him loud applause. Truly, gentlemen, said Cyrus, just as Chrysanthus says, I think we ought to march without delay, if only to be beforehand with our foes and reach their magazines before they do themselves. And besides, the quicker we are, the fewer resources we shall find with them. That is how I put the matter. But if anyone sees a safer or an easier way, let him instruct us. But many speakers followed, all urging an immediate march, without one speech in opposition. And so Cyrus took up the word again and said, My friends and allies, God helping us, our hearts, our bodies, and our weapons have now been long prepared. All that remains is to get together what we need for ourselves and our animals on a march of at least twenty days. I reckon that the journey itself must take more than fifteen, and not a vestige of food shall we find from end to end. It has been made away with, partly by ourselves, partly by our foes, so far as they could. We must collect enough corn, without which one can neither fight nor live. And as for wine? Every man must carry just so much as will accustom him to drink water. The greater part of the country will be absolutely devoid of wine, and the largest supply we could take with us would not hold out. But to avoid too sudden a change in the sickness that might follow, this is what we must do. We must begin by taking water with our food. We can do this without any great change in our habits. 
for every one who eats porridge has the oatmeal mixed with water, and every one who eats bread has the wheat soaked in water, and all boiled meat is prepared in water. We shall not miss the wine if we drink a little after a meal is done. Then we must gradually lessen the amount, until we find that, without knowing it, we have become water drinkers. Gradual change enables every creature to go through a complete conversion, and this is taught us by God, who leads us a little by little out of winter until we bear the blazing heat of summer, and out of heat back again into the depths of winter. So should we follow God, and take one step after another until we reach our goal. What you might spend on heavy rugs and coverlets, spend rather on food. Any superfluity here will not be wasted, and you will not sleep less soundly for lack of bedclothes. If you do, I give you leave to blame me. But with clothing, the case is different. A man can hardly have too much of that in sickness or in health. And for seasoning, you should take what is sharp and dry and salted. For such meats are more appetizing and more satisfying. And since we may come into districts as yet unravaged, where we may find growing corn, we ought to take hand mills for grinding. These are the lightest machines for the purpose. Nor must we forget to supply ourselves with medicines. They are small in bulk, and if need arises, invaluable. And we ought to have a large supply of straps. I wonder what is not fastened by a strap to man or horse. But straps wear out and get broken, and then things are at a standstill unless there are spare ones to be had. Some of you have learned to shave spears, so that it would be well not to forget a plane, and also to carry a rasp, for a man who sharpens a spearhead will sharpen his spirit too. He will feel ashamed to wet the edge and be a coward. And we must take plenty of timber for chariots and wagons. There is bound to be many a breakdown on the road. Also, we shall need the most necessary tools for repairs since smiths and carpenters are not to be found at every turn. But there are few who cannot patch up a makeshift for the time. Then there should be a mattock and a shovel apiece for every wagon, and on every beast of burden a bill-hook and an axe, always useful to the owner and sometimes a boon to all. The provisions must be seen to by the officers of the fighting line. They must inspect the men under their command, and see that nothing is omitted which any man requires, the mission of which will be felt by us all. Those of you who are in command of the baggage train will inspect what I have ordered for the animals, and insist upon every man being provided who is not already supplied. You, gentlemen, who are in command of the road makers, you have the lists of the soldiers I have disqualified from serving as javelin men, bowmen, or slingers and you will make the old javelin men march with axes for felling timber, the bowmen with mattocks, and slingers with shovels. They will advance by squads in front of the wagons, so that if there is any road-making to be done, you may set to work at once, and in case of need, I may know where to get the men I want. I mean also to take up corps of smiths, carpenters, and cobblers, men of military age provided with the proper tools to supply any possible need. These men will not be in the fighting line, but will have a place assigned to them where they can be hired by anyone who likes. If any huckster wishes to follow the army with his wares, he may do so, but if caught selling anything during the fifteen days for which provisions have been ordered, he will be deprived of all of his goods. After the fifteen days are done, he may sell what he likes. Any merchant who offers us a well-stocked market will receive recompense and honor from the allies and myself. And if anyone needs an advance of money for trading, he must send me guarantors who will undertake that he will march with the army, and then he can draw on our funds. These are the general orders, and I will ask any of you who think that anything has been omitted to point it out to me. You will now go back to your quarters and make your preparations. 
and while you do so I will offer sacrifice for our journey, and when the signs are favourable we will give the signal. At that you must present yourselves with everything I have ordered, at the appointed place under your own officers. And you, gentlemen, said he, turning to the officers, when your divisions are all in line, you will come to me in a body to receive your final orders. End of section 26section twenty seven of cyropedia the education of cyrus by xenophon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kane mercer cyropedia the education of cyrus by xenophon translated by h g dakins book six chapter three With these instructions, the army went to make their preparations while Cyrus offered sacrifice. As soon as the victims were favorable, he set out with his force. On the first day they encamped as nearby as possible, so that anything left behind could easily be fetched and any omission readily supplied. Cyaxares stayed in Medea with a third of the Median troops in order to not leave their own country undefended. Cyrus himself pushed forward with all possible speed, keeping his cavalry in the van and constantly sending explorers and scouts ahead to some lookout. Behind the cavalry came the baggage, and on the plains he had long strings of wagons and beasts of burden, and the main army behind them, so that if any baggage train fell back, the officers who caught them up would see that they did not lose their places in the march. But where the road was narrower, the fighting men marched on either side with the baggage in the middle, and in case of any block it was the business of the soldiers on the spot to attend to the matter. As a rule, the different regiments would be marching alongside their own baggage, orders having been given that all members on the train should advance by regiments unless absolutely prevented. To help matters, the brigadier's own body servant led way with an ensign known to his men, so that each regiment marched together, the men doing their best to keep up with their comrades. Thus, there was no need to search for each other, everything was to hand. There was greater security, and the soldiers could get what they wanted more quickly. After some days the scouts ahead thought they could see people in the plain collecting fodder and timber and they made out beasts of burden, some grazing and others already laden. And as they scanned the distance they felt sure they could distinguish something that was either smoke rising or clouds of dust, and from all this they concluded that the enemy's army was not far off. Whereupon their commander dispatched a messenger with the news to Cyrus, who sent back word that the scouts should stay where they were on their lookout and tell him if they saw anything more while he ordered a squadron of cavalry to ride forward and intercept, if they could, some of the men on the plain and discover the actual state of affairs. While the detachment carried out this order, Cyrus halted the rest of his army to make such dispositions as he thought necessary before coming to close quarters. His first order was for the troops to take their breakfast. After breakfast they were to fall in and wait for the word of command. When breakfast was over, he sent for all the officers from the cavalry, the infantry, and the chariot brigade, and for all the commanders of the battering engines and the baggage train, and they came to him. Meanwhile, the troop of horse had dashed into the plain, cut off some of the men, and now brought them in captive. The prisoners, on being questioned by Cyrus, said they belonged to the camp, and had gone out to forage or cut wood so they had passed beyond their own pickets, for, owing to the size of their army, everything was scarce. How far is your army from here? said Cyrus. About seven miles, said they. Was there any talk about us down there? said he. We should think there was, they answered. It was all over the camp that you were coming. Ah, said Cyrus. I suppose they were glad to hear we were coming so soon, putting this question for his officers to hear the answer. That they were not, said the prisoners. They were anything but glad. 
They were miserable. And what are they doing now? said Cyrus. Forming their line of battle, said they. Yesterday and the day before, they did the same. And their commander, said Cyrus. Who is he? Croesus himself, said they. And with him, a Greek, and also another man, a Mede, who is said to be a deserter from you. Ah, cried Cyrus, is that so? Most mighty Zeus, may I deal with him as I wish. Then he had the prisoners led away, and turned to speak to his officers. But at this moment another scout appeared, saying that a large force of cavalry was in the plain. We think, he added, that they are trying to get a sight of our army, for about thirty of them are riding ahead at good round pace, and they seem to be coming straight for our little company, perhaps to capture a lookout if they can, for there are only ten of us there. At that Cyrus sent off a detachment from his own bodyguard, bidding them gallop up to the place unseen by the enemy and stay there motionless. Wait, he said, until our own ten must leave the spot and dash out on the thirty as they come up a hill. And to prevent any injury from the larger body, do you, Hystapas, said he, turning to the latter, ride out with a thousand horse and let them see you suddenly face to face. But remember not to pursue them out of sight. Come back as soon as you have secured our post, and if any of your opponents ride up with their right hands raised, welcome them as friends. Accordingly, Hystapas went off and got under arms, while the bodyguard galloped to the spot. But before they reached the scouts, someone met them with his squires, the man who had been sent out as a spy, the guardian of the lady from Susa, Araspas himself. When the news reached Cyrus, he sprang up from his seat, went to meet him himself, and clasped his hand. But the others, who of course knew nothing, were utterly dumbfounded, until Cyrus said, Gentlemen! The best of our friends has come back to us. It is high time that all men should know what he has done. It was not through any baseness or any weakness or any fear of me that he left us. It was because I sent him to be my messenger, to learn the enemy's doings and bring us word. Araspas, I have not forgotten what I promised you. I will repay you. We will all repay you. For gentlemen, it is only just that all of you should pay him honor. Good and true I call him who risked himself for all our good, and took upon himself a reproach that was heavy to bear. At that all crowded around Araspas took him by the hand and made him welcome. Then Cyrus spoke again. Enough, my friends, Araspas has news for us, and it is time to hear it. Tell us your tale, Araspas. Keep back nothing of the truth and do not make out the power of the enemy less than it really is. It is far better that we should find it smaller than we looked for rather than strong beyond our expectations. Well, began Araspas, in order to learn their numbers, I managed to be present at the marshalling of their troops. Then you can tell us, said Cyrus, not only their numbers but their disposition in the field. That I can, answered Araspas, and also how they propose to fight. Good, said Cyrus. But first let us hear their numbers in brief. Well, he answered, they are drawn up thirty deep, infantry and cavalry alike, all except the Egyptians, and they cover about five miles. For I was at great pains, he added, to find out how much ground they occupied. And the Egyptians, Cyrus said, how are they drawn out? I noticed you said all except the Egyptians. The Egyptians, he answered, are drawn up in companies of 10,000, under their own officers, a hundred deep and a hundred broad. That, they insisted, was their usual formation at home. Croatius, however, was very loth to let them have their own way with this. He wished to outflank you as much as possible. Why? Cyrus asked. What was his object? To encircle you, I imagine, with his wings. He had better take care, said Cyrus, or his circle may find itself in the center. But now you have told us what we most needed to know, and you, gentlemen, he said to the officers, on leaving this meeting you will look to your weapons and your harness. 
it often happens that the lack of some little thing makes man or horse or chariot useless to-morrow morning early when i'm offering sacrifice do you take your breakfast and give your steeds to the provender so as when the moment comes to strike you may not be found wanting and you eraspus must hold the right wing in the position it has now and the rest of you who command a thousand men must do the same with your divisions it is no time to be changing horses when the race is being run and you will send word to the brigadiers and captains under you to draw up the phalanx with each company two deep now a company consisted of four and twenty men then one of the officers a captain of ten thousand said do you think cyrus that with so shallow a depth we can stand against their tremendous phalanx but do you suppose rejoined he that any phalanx so deep that the rear ranks cannot close with the enemy should do much either for friend or foe i myself he added would rather have this heavy infantry of theirs were drawn up not a hundred but ten thousand deep we should have all the fewer to fight whereas with the depth that i propose i believe we shall not waste a man every part of our army will work with every other i will post the javelin men behind the cuirassiers and the archers behind them it would be absurd to place in the van troops who admit they are not made for hand-to-hand -hand fighting but with the cuirassiers thrown in front of them they will stand firm enough and harass the enemy over the heads of our own men with their arrows and their darts and every stroke that falls on the enemy means much relief to our friends in the very rear of all i will post our reserve a house is useless without a foundation as well as a roof and our phalanx will be no use unless it has a rear guard and a van both of them good you he added will draw up the ranks to suit these orders and you who command the targeteers will follow with your companies in the same depth and you who command the archers will follow the targeteers gentlemen of the reserve you will hold your men in the rear and pass the word down to your own subordinates to watch the men in front cheer on those who do their duty threaten him who plays the coward and if any man shows signs of treachery see that he dies the death it is for those in the van to hearten those behind them by word and deed it is for you the reserve to make the cowards dread you more than the foe you know your work and you will do it euphrates he added turning to the officer in command of the artillery see that the wagons with the towers keep as close to the phalanx as possible and you Dauchus, bring the whole of your baggage train under cover of the towers and make sure your squires punish severely any man who breaks the line you carochas keep the woman's carriages close behind the baggage train this long line of followers should give an impression of vast numbers allow our own men opportunity for ambuscades and force the enemy if he try to surround us to widen his circuit and the wider he makes it the weaker he will be that then is your business and you gentlemen arta ozas and arta jersas each of you take your thousand foot and guard the baggage and you farnochas and asiadates neither of you must lead your thousand horse into the fighting line you must get them under arms by themselves behind the carriages and you must come to me with the officers as fully equipped as if you were to be the first to fight you sir who command the camel corps will take your post behind the carriages and look for further orders to martyrs officers of the war chariots you will draw lots among yourselves and he on whom the lot falls will bring his hundred chariots in front of the fighting line while the other two sentries will support our flanks on the right and left such were the dispositions made by cyrus but abradatis lord of susa cried cyrus let me i pray you volunteer for the post in the front and cyrus struck with admiration for the man took him by the hand and turning to the persians in command of the other sentries said perhaps gentlemen you will allow this but they answered that it was hard to resign the post of honour and so they all drew lots 
and the lot fell on Aradatis, and his post was face to face with the Egyptians. Then the officers left the council and carried out the orders given, and took their evening meal and posted the pickets and went to rest. End of section 27《Section 28 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer — Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon — Translated by H. G. Dakins — Book 6, Chapter 4 but early on the morrow Cyrus offered sacrifice, and meanwhile the rest of the army took their breakfast, and after the libation they armed themselves, a great and goodly company in bright tunics and splendid breastplates and shining helmets. All the horses had frontlets and chestplates, the chargers had armor on their shoulders, and the chariot horses on their flanks so that the whole army flashed with bronze, and it shone like a flower with scarlet. The eight-horse chariot of Abradatis was a marvel of beauty and richness, and just as he was about to put the linen corslet of his native land, Panthea came, bringing him a golden breastplate and a helmet of gold, and armlets and broad bracelets for his wrists, and a full-flowing purple tunic and a hyacinth-colored helmet plume. All these she had made for him in secret, taking the measure of his armor without his knowledge. And when he saw them, he gazed in wonder and said, Dear wife, and did you destroy your own jewels to make this armor for me? But she said, No, my lord, at least not the richest of them all, for you shall be my loveliest jewel when others see you as I do now. As she spoke, she put the armor on him. But then, though she tried to hide it, the tears rolled down her cheeks. And truly, when Abradatis was arrayed in the new panoply, he, who had been fair enough to look upon before, was now a sight of splendor, noble and beautiful and free, and indeed his nature was. He took the reins from the charioteer and was about to set foot on the car, when Panthea bade the bystanders withdraw, and said to him, My own lord! Little need to tell you what you know already. Yet this I say, if any woman loved her husband more than her own soul, I am of her company. Why should I try to speak? Our lives say more than any words of mine. And yet, feeling for you what you know, I swear to you by the love between us that I would rather go down in the grave beside you after a hero's death than live on with you in shame. I have thought you worthy of the highest, and believe myself worthy to follow you, and I bear in mind the great gratitude we owe Cyrus, who, when I was his captive, chosen for his spoil, was too high-minded to treat me as a slave or dishonor me as a free woman. He took me and saved me for you, as though I had been his brother's wife, and when Eraspas, my warder, turned from him, I promised. If he would let me send for you, I would bring him a friend in the other's place, far nobler and more faithful. And as Panthea spoke, Abradatis listened with rapture to her words, and when she ended, he laid his hand upon her head, and looking up to the heavens, he prayed aloud, O oh, most mighty Zeus, make me worthy to be Panthea's husband, and the friend of Cyrus, who showed us honor. Then he opened the driver's seat and mounted the car, and the driver shut the door, and Panthea could not take him in her arms again, so she bent and kissed the chariot box. Then the car rolled forward, and she followed unseen, till Abradatis turned and saw her and cried, Be strong, Panthea, be of good heart, farewell and he thee home. Thereupon her chamberlains and her maidens took her and brought her back to her own carriage, and laid her down, and drew the awning. But no man of all who was there that day, splendid as Abradatis was in his chariot, had eyes to look on him until Panthea had gone. Meanwhile Cyrus had found the victims favorable, 
and his army was already drawn up in the order he had fixed. He had scouts posted ahead, one behind the other, and he called his officers together for his final words. Gentlemen, my friends and allies, the sacred signs from heaven are as they were the day the gods gave us victory before, and I would call to your minds thoughts to bring you gladness and confidence for the fight. You are far better trained than your enemies. You have lived together and worked together far longer than they. You have won victories together. What they have shared with one another has been defeat, and those who have not fought as yet feel they have traitors to the right and left of them, while our recruits know that they enter battle in company with men who help their allies. Those who trust each other will stand firm and fight without flinching, but when confidence has gone no man thinks anything but flight. Forward then, gentlemen, against the foe. Drive our scythe chariots against the defenseless cars. Let our armed cavalry charge their unprotected horse, and charge them home. The mass of their infantry you have met before, and as for the Egyptians, they are armed in much the same way as they are marshaled. They carry shields too big to let them stir or see. They are drawn up a hundred deep, which will prevent all but the merest handful fighting. If they count on forcing us back by their weight, they must first withstand our steel and the charge of our cavalry. And if any of them do hold firm, how can they fight at once against cavalry, infantry, and turrets of artillery? for our men on the towers will be there to help us. They will smite the enemy until he flies instead of fighting. If you think that there is anything wanting, tell me now. God helping us, we will lack nothing. And if any man wishes to say anything, let him speak now. If not, go to the altar and pray to the gods to whom we have sacrificed, and then fall in. Let each man say to his own men what I have said to him. Let him show the men he rules that he is fit to rule. Let them see the fearlessness in his face, his bearing, and his words. End of section 28 Section 29 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emery. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 7, Chapter 1. So they prayed to the gods and went to their place. And the squires bought food and drink to Cyrus and his staff as they stood round the sacrifice. And he took his breakfast where he stood after making the due offering, sharing what he had with all who needed it, and he poured out the libation and prayed, and then drank, and his men with him. Then he supplicated Zeus, the god of his fathers, to be his leader and helper in the fight, and so he mounted his horse and bade those about him follow. All his squires were equipped as he was, with scarlet tunics, breastplates of bronze, and brazen helmets plumed with white short swords, and a lance of cornel wood apiece. Their horses had frontlets, chest plates and armor for their shoulders all of bronze and the shoulder pieces served as leg guards for the riders in one thing only the arms of cyrus differed from the rest theirs was covered with a golden varnish and his flashed like a mirror as he sat on his steed gazing into the distance where he meant to go a peal of thunder rang out on the right and he cried we will follow thee o zeus most high so he set forth with Chrysanthus on his right at the head of cavalry and Arsamus on his left with infantry. And the word went down the lines, Eyes on the standard and steady marching. The standard was a golden eagle, with outspread wings, borne aloft on a long spear shaft, and to this day such is the standard of the Persian king. Before they came in full sight of the Assyrians, Cyrus halted the army thrice. And when they had gone about two miles or more, they began to see the enemy advancing. As soon as both armies were in full view of each other, and the Assyrians could see how much they outflanked the Persians on either side, Croesus halted, and ordered to prepare an encircling movement, and pushed out a column on the right wing and the left, so that the Persian forces might be attacked on every side at once. 
cyrus saw it but gave no sign of stopping he led straight on as before meanwhile he noticed that the turning point where the assyrians had pushed out on either flank was an immense distance from their centre and he said to chrysantas do you see where they have fixed their angle yes i do answered chrysantas and i am surprised at it it seems to me they are drawing their wings too far away from their centre just so said cyrus and from ours too why are they doing that asked the other clearly said cyrus they are afraid we shall attack if their wings are in touch with us while our centre is still some way off but went on chrysantas how can they support each other at such a distance doubtless said cyrus as soon as their wings are opposite our flanks they will wheel round and then advance at once on every side and so set us fighting everywhere at once well said chrysantas do you think the movement wise yes said cyrus it is good enough in view of what they can see but in view of what they cannot it is worse for them than if they had advanced in a single column do you he said turning to arsimus advance with your infantry slowly taking your pace from me and do you chrysantas march beside him with your cavalry step for step i will make for their angle myself or i propose to join battle first riding round the army to see how things are with all our men when i reach the point and we are on the verge of action i will raise the paean and you must quicken your pace you will know when we have closed with the enemy the din will be loud enough at the same moment abradatus will dash out upon them such will be his orders your duty is to follow keeping as close to the chariots as possible thus we shall fall on the enemy at the height of his confusion and god helping me i shall be with you also cutting my way through the route by the quickest road i can so he spoke and sent the watchword down the lines zeus our saviour and zeus our leader and went forward as he passed between the chariots and the cuirassiers he would say to some my men the look on your faces rejoices my heart and to others you understand gentlemen that this battle is not for the victory of a day but for all that we have won ere now and for all our happiness to come and to others my friends we can never reproach the gods again today they have put all blessings in our hands let us show ourselves good men and true or else gentlemen can we invite each other to a more glorious feast than this this day all gallant hearts are bidden this day they may feast their friends or again you know i think the prizes in this game the victors pursue and smite and slay and win wealth and fame and freedom and empire the crowds lose them all he who loves his own soul let him fight beside me for i will have no disgrace but if he met soldiers who had fought for him before he only said to you gentlemen what need i say you know the brave man's part in battle and the cravens and when he came to abradatus he halted and abradatus gave the reins to his charioteer and came up to him and others gathered round from the infantry and the chariots and cyrus said god has rewarded you abradatus according to your prayer you and yours you hold the first rank among our friends and you will not forget when the moment for action comes that those who watch you will be persians and those who follow you and they will not let you bear the brunt alone and abradatus answered even so cyrus and with us here methinks all looks well enough but the state of our flanks troubles me the enemy's wings are strong and stretch far he has chariots there and every kind of arm as well while we have nothing else with which to oppose him so that for myself said he if i had not won by lot the post i hold i should feel ashamed to be here in the safest place of all nay answered cyrus if it is well with you have no concern for the rest god willing i mean to relieve our flanks but you yourself i conjure you do not attack until you see the rout of those detachments that you fear so much of boasting did cyrus allow himself on the eve of action though he was the last man to boast at other times when you see them routed he said you may take it that i am there and then make your rush for that is the moment when you will find the enemy weakest and your own men strongest and while there is time abradatus be sure to drive along your front and prepare your men for the charge kindle their courage by your looks lift up their hearts by your hopes breathe the spirit of emulation into them to make them prove themselves the flower of the chariot force be assured if things go well with us all men will say nothing is so profitable as valor accordingly abradatus mounted his chariot and drove along the lines to do as cyrus bade meanwhile cyrus went on to the left where hystaspus was posted with half the persian cavalry and he called to him and said hystaspus here is work to test your pace if we are quick enough in cutting off their heads none of us will be slaughtered first 
and Hespospus answered with a laugh. Leave it to us. We'll see to the men opposite, but set someone to deal with the fellows on our flank. It would be a pity for them to be idle. And Cyrus answered, I am going to them myself. But remember, Hestospus, to whichever of us God grants the victory, so long as a single foeman is on the field, attack we must, again and again, until the last has yielded. With that he passed on, and as he came to the flank he went up to the officer in command of the chariots and said to him, Good, I intend to support you myself, and when you hear me fall on the wing, at that instant do your best to charge straight through your opponents. You will be far safer once outside their ranks than if you are caught halfway. Then he went on to the rear in the carriages, where the two detachments were stationed, a thousand horse and a thousand foot, and told Atagerses and Pharnotius, their leaders, to keep the men where they were. But when, he added, you see me close with the enemy on our right, then set upon those in front of you, take them in flank, where they are weakest, while you advance in line at your full strength. Their lines, as you see, are closed by cavalry. Hurl your camels at these, and you may be sure, even before the fighting begins, they will cut a comic figure. Thus, with all his dispositions made, Cyrus rode round the head of his right. By this time Croesus, believing that the center, where he himself was marching, must be nearer the enemy than the distant wings, had this signal raised for them to stop their advance, halt, and wheel round where they were. When they were in position opposite the Persian force, he signaled for them to charge, and thus three columns came at once against Cyrus, one facing his front and one on either flank. A tremor ran through the whole army. It was completely enclosed, like a little brick laid within a large, with the forces of the enemy all around it, on every side except the rear, cavalry and heavy infantry, targeteers, archers, and chariots. None the less, the instant Cyrus gave the word, they swung round to confront the foe. There was deep silence through the remarks as they realized what they had to face, and then Cyrus, when the moment came, began the battle hymn, and it thundered through the host. And as it died away, the war cry rang out unto the god of battles, and Cyrus swooped forward at the head of his cavalry, straight for the enemy's flank, and closed with them then and there, while the infantry behind him followed, swift and steady, wave on wave, sweeping out on either side, far outflanking their opponents, for they attacked in line, and the foe were in column, to the great gain of Cyrus. A short struggle, and the ranks broke and fled before him headlong. Artagersus, seeing that Cyrus had got to work, made his own charge on the left, hurling his camels forward as Cyrus had advised. Even at a distance the horses could not face the camels. They seemed to go mad with fear, and galloped off in terror, rearing and falling foul of one another, such is the strange effect of camels upon horses. So that Artagersus, his own troops well in hand, had easy work with the enemy's bewildered masses. At the same moment the war chariots dashed in, right and left, so that many, flying from the chariots, were cut down by the troopers, and many, flying from these, were caught by the chariots. And now Abradatus could wait no longer. Follow me, my friends, he shouted, and drove straight at the enemy, lashing his good steeds forward till their flanks were bloody with the goad, and other charioteers racing hard behind him. The enemy's chariots fled before them instantly, some not even waiting to take up their fighting men. But Abradatus drove on through them, straight into the main body of the Egyptians, his rush shared by his comrades on either hand. And then, what has often been shown elsewhere was shown here, namely, that of all strong formations the strongest is a band of friends. His brothers in arms and his messmates charged with him, but the others, when they saw that the solid ranks of the Egyptians stood firm, swung round and pursued the flying chariots. Meanwhile, Abradatus and his companions could make no further way. There was not a gap through the Egyptian lines on either hand, and they could but charge the single soldiers where they stood, overthrow them by the sheer weight of horse and car, and crush them and their arms beneath the hoofs and wheels. And when the skis caught them, men and weapons were cut to shreds. In the midst of indescribable confusion, the chariots rocking along the weltering mounds, Abradatus was thrown out and some of his comrades with him. There they stood and fought like men, and there they were cut down and died. The Persians, pouring in after them, dealt slaughter and destruction where Abradatus and his men had charged and shaken the ranks. But elsewhere the Egyptians, who were still unscathed, and there were many, moved steadily on to meet them. There followed a desperate struggle with lance and spear and sword, and still the Egyptians had the advantage, because of their numbers and their weapons. Their spears were immensely stout and long, such as they carry to this day, and the huge shield not only gave more protection than corslet and buckler, but aided the thrust of the fighter, slung as it was from the shoulder. Shield locked into shield, 
they thrust their way forward and the persians could not drive them back with their light bucklers borne on the forearm only step by step they gave ground dealing blow for blow till they came under cover of their own artillery then at last a second shower of blows fell on the egyptians while the reserves would allow no flight of the archers or the javelin men at the sword's point they made them do their duty thick was the slaughter and loud the din of clashing weapons and whirring darts and shouting warriors cheering each other and calling on the gods at this moment cyrus appeared cutting his way through his own opponents to see the persians thrust from their position was misery to him but he knew he could check the enemy's advance most quickly by galloping round to their rear and thither he dashed bidding his troops follow and there they fell upon them and smote them as they were gazing ahead and there they mowed them down the egyptians seeing what had happened cried out that the enemy had taken them in the rear and wheeled round under a storm of blows at this the confusion reached its height cavalry and infantry struggling all together an egyptian fell under cyrus's horse and as the hoofs struck him he stabbed the creature in the belly the charger reared at the blow and cyrus was thrown then was seen what it is for a leader to be loved by his men with a terrible cry the men dashed forward conquering thrust with thrust and blow with blow one of his squires leapt down and set Cyrus on his own charger, and as Cyrus sprang on the horse he saw the Egyptians worsted everywhere. For by now Hystaspus was on the ground with his cavalry, and Chrysantus also. Still Cyrus would not allow them to charge the Egyptian phallics. The archers and javelin men were to play on them from outside. Then he made his way along the lines to the artillery, and there he mounted one of the towers to take a survey of the field, and see if any of the foes still held their ground and kept up the fight but he saw the plain one chaos of flying horses and men and chariots pursuers and pursued conquerors and conquered and nowhere any who stood firm save only the egyptians these and sure straits as they were formed themselves into a circle behind a ring of steel and sat down under cover of their enormous shields they no longer attempted to act but they suffered and they suffered heavily cyrus in admiration and pity unwilling that men so brave should be done to death drew off his soldiers who were fighting round them and would not let another man lift sword then he sent them a herald asking if they wished to be cut to pieces for the sake of those who had betrayed them or save their lives and keep their reputation for gallantry and they answered is it possible that we can be saved and yet keep our reputation untarnished and cyrus said surely yes for we ourselves have seen that you alone have held your ground and been ready to fight but even so said the egyptians how can we act in honor if we save ourselves by betraying none of those at whose side you fought answered cyrus only surrender your arms to us and become our friends the friends of men who chose to save you when they might have destroyed you and if we become your friends said they how will you treat us as you treat us answered he and the treatment shall be good and what will that good treatment be they asked once more this said cyrus better pay than you have had so long as the war lasts and when peace comes if you choose to stay with me lands and cities and women and servants then they asked him if he would excuse them from one duty service against croesus croesus they said was the only leader who knew them for the rest they were content to agree and so they came to terms and took and gave pledges of good faith thus it came about that their descendants are to this day faithful subjects of the king and cyrus gave them cities some in the interior which are still called the cities of the egyptians beside Larissa, and Kaline, and Kaim, on the coast, still held by their descendants. When this matter was arranged, darkness had already fallen, and Cyrus drew off his army and encamped at Thimbrara. In this engagement the Egyptians alone among the enemy won themselves renown, and of the troops under Cyrus the Persian cavalry was held to have done the best, so much so that to this day they are still armed in the manner that Cyrus devised. High praise was also given to the scythe-bearing chariots, and this engine of war is still employed by the reigning king as for the camels all they did was to scare the horses their riders could take no part in the slaughter and were never touched themselves by the enemy's cavalry for not a horse would come near the camels it was a useful arm certainly but no gallant gentleman would dream of breeding camels for his own use or learning to fight on camelback and so they returned to their old position among the baggage train end of section twenty nine recording by emory Section 30 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emery. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 7, Chapter 2. Then Cyrus and his men took their evening meal and posted their pickets and went to rest. Bercroesus and his army fled in haste to Sardis, and the other tribes hurried away homewards under cover of night as fast and as far as they could. When day broke, Cyrus marched straight for Sardis, and when he came before the citadel, he set up his engines as though for the assault and got out his ladders. But the following night he sent a scaling party of Persians and Chaldeans to climb the fortifications at the steepest point. The guide was a Persian who had served as a slave to one of the garrison in the citadel, and who knew a way down to the river by which one could get up. As soon as it became clear that the heights had been taken, all the Lydians without exception fled from the walls and hid wherever they could. At daybreak Cyrus entered the city and gave orders that not a man was to leave the ranks. Croesus, who had shut himself up inside his palace, cried out on Cyrus, and Cyrus left a guard round the building while he himself went to inspect the captured citadel. Here he found the Persians keeping guard in perfect order, but the Chaldean quarters were deserted, for the men had rushed down to pillage the town. Immediately he summoned their officers, and bade them leave his army at once. I could never endure, he said, to have undisciplined fellows seizing the best of everything. You know well enough, he added, all that was in store for you. I meant to make all who served with me the envy of their fellows, but now, he said, you cannot be surprised if you encounter someone stronger than yourselves on your way home. Fear fell on the Chaldeans at this, and they entreated him to lay aside his anger and vowed they would give back all the booty they had taken. He answered that he had no need of it himself. But if, he added, you wish to appease me, you will hand it over to those who stayed and guarded the citadel. For if my soldiers see that discipline means reward, all will be well with us. So the Chaldeans did as he bade them, and the faithful and obedient received all manner of good things. Then Cyrus made his troops encamp in the most convenient quarter of the town, and told them to stay at their post and take their breakfast there. That done, he gave orders that Croesus should be brought to him, and when he came into his presence, Croesus cried, Hail, Cyrus, my lord and master! Fate has given you that title from now henceforward, and thus must I salute you. All hail to you likewise, answered Cyrus. We are both of us men. And tell me now, he continued, would you be more willing to advise me as a friend? I should be more than glad, said Croesus, to do you any good. It would mean good for myself, I know. Listen then, answered Cyrus. I see that my soldiers have endured much toil and encountered many dangers, and now they are persuaded that they have taken the wealthiest city in all Asia, after Babylon. I would not have them cheated of their recompense, seeing that if they win nothing by their labor, I know not how I can keep them obedient to me for long. Yet I am unwilling to give them this city over to plunder. I believe it would be utterly destroyed. And moreover, I know full well that in plunder the worst villains win the most. To this Croesus answered, Suffer me then to tell what Lydians I please, that I have won your promise that the city shall not be sacked, nor their women and children made away with. I promise you in return that my men will bring you willingly everything that is costly and beautiful in Sardis. If I can announce such terms, I am certain there is not one treasure belonging to man or woman that will not be yours tomorrow. Further, on this day year, the city will overflow once more with wealth and beauty. But if you sack it, you will destroy the crafts in its ruin, and they, we know, are the wellspring of all loveliness. I'll bet you need not decide at once. Wait and see what is brought to you. Send first, he added, to my own treasuries, and let your guards take some of my own men with them. To all this Cyrus consented, and then he said, And now, O Croesus, tell me one more thing. How did matters go between you and the oracle at Delphi? It is said that you did much reverence to Apollo and obeyed him in all things. I could wish it had been so, said Croesus, but, truth to say, from the beginning I have acted in all things against him. How can that be, said Cyrus? Explain it to me, for your words seem strange indeed. Because, he answered, in the first place, instead of asking the god for all I wanted, I must needs put him to the test, to see if he could speak the truth. This, he added, no man of honor could endure, let be the godhead. Those who are doubted cannot love their doubters. And yet he stood the test, for though the things I did were strange, and I was many leagues from Delphi, he knew them all. And so I resolved to consult him about my children. At first he would not so much as answer me but I sent him many an offering, some of gold and some of silver, 
and I propitiated him, as I deemed, by countless sacrifices, and at last he answered me when I asked him what I must do that sons might be born to me. He said they should be born, and so they were, and that he uttered no lie, but they brought me no joy. One of them was dumb his whole life long, and the noblest perished in the flower of his youth, and I, crushed by these sorrows, sent again to the god and asked him how I could live in happiness for the rest of my days, and he answered, Know thyself, O Croesus, and happiness shall be thine. And when I heard the oracle, I was comforted. I said to myself, The god has laid the lightest of tasks upon me, and promised me happiness in return. Some of his neighbors a man may know, and others not, but every one can know himself. So I thought, and in truth so long as I was at peace I had no fault to find with my lot after my son's death. But when the Assyrian persuaded me to march against you, I encountered every danger. Yet I was saved, I came to no harm. Once again, therefore, I have no charge to bring against the god. When I knew myself incapable of warring against you, he came to my help and saved mine and me. But afterwards, intoxicated by my wealth, cajoled by those who begged me to be their leader, tempted by the gifts they showered on me, flattered by all who said that if I would but lead them they would obey me to a man, and that I would be the greatest ruler in all the world, and that all their kings had met together and chosen me for their champion in the war. I undertook the generalship as though I were born to be the monarch of the world, for I did not know myself. I thought myself able to fight against you, you who are sprung from the seed of the gods, born of a royal line, trained in valor and virtue from your youth, while I, I believed that the first of my ancestors to reign won his freedom and his crown on the self-same day. For this dull ignorance of mine I see I am justly punished. But now at last, Osiris, he cried, now I know myself. And tell me, do you think the god will still speak truth? Do you think that, knowing myself, I can be happy now? I ask you, because you of all men have it in your power to answer best. Happiness is yours to give. Cyrus answered, Give me time to deliberate, Croesus. I bear in mind your former happiness, and I pity you. I give you back at once your wife and your daughters, for they tell me you have daughters, and your friends and your attendants. They are yours once more. And yours it is to sit at your own table as you used to live. But battles and wars I must put out of your power. Now by the gods above us, cried Croesus, you need take no further thought about your answer. If you will do for me what you say, I shall live the life that all men called the happiest of lives, and I know that they were right. And who, said Cyrus, who was it that lived that life of happiness? My own wife, said Croesus. She shared all my good things with me, my luxuries, my softest joys, but in the cares on which those joys were based, in war and battle and strife, she had no part or lot. Methinks you will provide for me as I provided for her whom I loved beyond all others in the world, and I must needs send to Apollo again, and send thank offerings. And as Cyrus listened, he marveled at the man's contentedness of soul, and for the future, wherever he went, he took Croesus with him, either because he thought he might be useful, or perhaps because he felt it was safer so. End of section 30 Recording by Emery